our heroes did not come from a future where everything has gone horribly wrong, they did not travel back in time to save the world from a bleak or miserable fate, as a matter of fact, all they want to do is find a way back home as soon as possible, he <laughs> he, hey, watch where you're putting those hands of yours, Nana-chan, or, but I can't help it, Mitsu, just look at these babies, how do you do it, I hear soy, fish, and dairy products are good for them, that, and regular massages, oh ho, and Mitsu's got that handsome boyfriend to give her nice and thorough rub downs, doesn't she, lucky thing, AR, it's not like that Nana, Koru, W we're not one of those couples, oh, you're blushing, you're totally blushing, splash I am not, you're just seeing things, splash splash Kaya, Ritsu you jerk, watch where you're putting your hands, a large, white head man giggled to himself, setting down his spyglass to jot some quick notes in a messy shorthand, before picking the eyepiece back up and resuming his perverted espionage, he was perched on a cliff overlooking a small lake where a few attractive young women in itty bitty swimsuits were enjoying a day to themselves, giggling as they splashed each other in the shallows and indulged in stereotypical fanciness and skinship. Jiraiya of the Sanin watched intently as the young women played and cavorted, showing off their curves with tight, skimpy bikinis. He drooled a little bit as he watched them jiggle and bounce, their bosom seemingly threatening to break loose of those cruelly snug confines. His notepad was filled with sketches and observations, three pages so far, just from watching these girls. Women abroad were fine and dandy, but it seemed that nothing could beat his hometown hotties. With a toothy grin and a dopey expression, Jiraiya paused in his observations to scribble down a couple more notes in his personal shorthand indecipherable to anyone but himself and his students, another giggle escaping his lips as the shorter brunette slipped her hands up the more buxom raven-head beauty's bikini top, the lankier, skinnier, Sandy-haired one with the frilly skirt-like bottom titted and jeered teasingly at her friends. Silently, Jiraiya thanked the powers that be for allowing him this veritable goldmine of inspiration, and to think, he probably wouldn't have come back to the leaf at this time if he hadn't gotten news that his godson was participating in the Chuanin exams. I'll have to thank the kid for giving me an excuse to come back into town, Jiraiya mused. If it looks like he can handle it, maybe I'll give him some lessons on the Jinchuriki basics. If he has access to even half as much chakra as his mother, or if he has even the slightest fraction of his old man's ingenuity, then Naruto ought to take to my lessons like a fish to water. And speaking of fish in water, it seemed that the raven-haired beauty had lost her top, and was now wrestling the brunette's bottom off in retaliation. The dirty blonde was laughing her nice and perky ass off, a bit of blood trickled from Jiraiya's nostrils. He licked his lips and resumed furiously scribbling down notes. Yes, returning to Kanoha when he did was probably one of the best decisions he had made in quite a while. If he was really lucky, he might even find a pretty young Oyajikan hankering to get down with a legendary shinobi. Hehe, he, maybe next I'll check out the hot springs, he mused. Jiraiya had a good feeling about today. Congratulations you three, you've officially progressed to the third stage of the exams, Kakashi said to his students as he led them back out of the forest of death, running through the treetops at a leisurely, by their standards, pace. You've done very well so far, Naruto and Sakura smiled at the compliment, even this time around with their abilities as high as they were, Kakashi rarely doled out any significant praise, he wasn't the sort of teacher to carelessly feed his students egos, Sasuke however, could hardly care less about praise from the copy ninja, of course we have, he drooled, looking askance at their Jounin sensei, you've seen how good we are, Kakashi, frankly, these exams are beneath us, at least until we have to fight each other, Sakura interjected, then it'll probably become a real challenge, Naruto grinned, a faraway look in his eye, he stroked his chin thoughtfully and glanced sidelong at his male teammate. It's been a while since me and Sasuke have had a real all-out match, he commented. I can't wait to fight him seriously in the finals Sakura shot him a warning glare. Not in that stadium. You don't, she reprimanded. Please try to think of the potential collateral damage before you act, Naruto. If you and Sasuke were to fight at full power inside the village boundary she trailed off, before shaking her head and favoring the blonde with a smirk, comma but, well, that aside. Sasuke will have to get through me or Hinata before you can fight him, anyways, Naruto laughed good-naturedly, ah true, him and me are on opposite ends of the tournament bracket aren't we, we are, Sasuke said, his expression neutral, more's the pity really, you get one less fight than me, I wouldn't count your eggs before they hatch, Kakashi interjected, you can never be sure how a match might turn out, and if you go into the fight too cocky, you're very liable to overreach yourself and make a stupid mistake, Sasuke rolled his eyes, do you really think any of us are actually likely to lose our fights he scoffed. No, probably not, the copy ninja admitted blithely, shrugging, but you can never be too cautious, I'd contest that, and say that a certain degree of recklessness is needed to do well in battle, but I really don't care, 
Sasuk flippantly responded, Turtling is for people who can't effortlessly dismantle their opponent with just a glance, Sakura laughed. How typical of you, Sasuke, she said wryly, patting him affectionately on the shoulder. I suppose you'll continue fighting with a handicap in the finals you know he only whips that out for serious opponents, Naruto quipped, like when we fought Zabuza on the way to wave. And even then it was total overkill, honestly, Kakashi tiredly shook his head, remembering the incident in question. He dropped to a lower elevation in the branches, jumping nimbly through the titanic foliage of training ground 44. Despite the speed at which he was moving, not his maximum by any means, but still fast enough to leave most other ninja panting and wheezing in the dust. His cute little genin were matching his pace perfectly, and showing few if any signs of exertion. These kids really were in a whole other league from their peers. Ah yes, Kakashi said absent mindedly. By the way do try not to go overboard, okay? It would look bad to the other sensei if any of my students killed their students. We won't kill anyone Sakura said promptly. Not unless they try to kill us, first. And even then, only if they actually pose a threat of successfully doing so, which is pretty dang unlikely, in my opinion, she smiled, absent-mindedly punching her way through a tree. Not for any real reason, mostly just because it was there, and she felt like showing off, so she struck the trunk with a small, bare fist, smashing through the wood with laughable ease. The upper segment of the tree teetered for a moment, the remaining area around the gaping hole quite insufficient to support its weight, before falling to the forest floor with a crash. Gah. Timber. Naruto called out behind them, sidestepping the falling mass of wood, you gotta shout out Timber, when you're going to be knocking trees over, Sakura, that's the rule, remember, the pinkette pouted cutely at the blonde, or, but there wasn't anyone around to get hurt by it, she replied in a sugary tone, I was there, Naruto deadpanned, so was I, added Sasuke, a touch miffed, anyone who could be hurt by it, Sakura corrected, dropping the cutesy act and rolling her eyes, the two boys shared a look, then shrugged in unison, Fair enough, Sasuke said, I can take much bigger wood than that without going down, Naruto sniggered, and Sakura giggled, even Kakashi found himself biting back a chuckle, these kids are a bad influence on me, they're making my sense of humor more immature than ever, thought the man who had a jutsu that was literally just a glorified kancho, Sasuke gave the other three a black look, oh ha ha, very funny he muttered, real mature, you guys, I didn't say a thing, said Sakura angelically, and I'm sure you've gone down on much bigger wood, Naruto added cheekily, a twinkle of amusement in his eyes, Sasuke shot back with a rather vulgar gesture, and a curse too foul to be transcribed, language boys, Kakashi lazily reprimanded, we don't want people thinking I'm a bad influence on you do we, you are a bad influence, though Sasuke replied archly, I don't see anyone else reading smut in public, that's just because I'm not of age yet, Sakura interjected, waving a hand airily, well, physically, at least, she added mentally a second later, but you know full well what kind of reading habits I really have, dear. Sasuke couldn't actually hear Sakura's thoughts or anything like that, but he could still roughly tell what she was thinking by reading the look on her face. He glowered. You know what I mean. Kakashi shook his head and sighed. It was either that or chuckle. The kids could be terrifying when they got serious, but more often than not they tended to just joke around and pull each other's chains, didn't they? It's mature literature with love scenes, he drawled, glimpsing a light at the edge of the woods. You'll appreciate it when you're older, I'm sure. Sasuke rolled his eyes, but he didn't say anything to this, what do you think we should do about training for the final phase, Naruto mused, having a go at changing the subject, I'd been meaning to ask you about that, sensei -hum. well that's a good question, you three seem to have the basics down pat, Kakashi hummed thoughtfully, plus you've also shown plenty of ingenuity with your techniques, I do have a couple ideas, mind you, not that I'm really obligated to teach the three of you new jutsu, or anything, but I reckon you kids are ready for the next level, in terms of skill, at the very least, they burst out of the foliage, landing in front of one of the gates in the fence encircling the forest of death, Kakashi reached a hand into his vest, casually producing three small pieces of paper, channel some chakra into these he said, as they walked to the gate, it'll show your elemental affinity, not that I expect you kids to be able to master nature transformation in only a month's time, but it'll provide a decent foundation as far as what sort of jutsu will come easier to you, he handed one slip each to Sakura, Sasuke, and Naruto. With mildly amused expressions, the trio promptly did as Kakashi requested. Sakura's paper moistened, then crumbled, Sasuke's moistened, crinkled, split in half, crumbled, and burned. Naruto's did nothing for a second. Then, just when Kakashi was about to ask if the blonde was sure he was following the instructions correctly, the slip of paper flashed, shining like a thousand watt light bulb in the boy's hand, before exploding into a shower of multicolored sparks. Kakashi blinked, comma well, alright then, 
he muttered weakly, quite bemused by this development. Who wants to head to the onsen for a break? The trio smiled innocently before nodding in unison. Tsunade woke up to a shaft of sunlight stabbing through her eyelids. She saw nothing but a blinding reddishness that chased away the quiescent black of dreamless sleep, a dull and throbbing pain seeming to radiate outward from her optical nerves. Her lips felt dry and cracked. Her mouth might as well have been stuffed full of cotton gauze laced with the bitter, acid taste of cheap booze and vomit. Her ears were ringing and her head was throbbing, and her bladder felt ready to burst. The world-renowned medic groaned and rolled over on her futon, trying to squeeze her eyes more tightly shut against the intruding, and welcome solar luminescence. Her joints were stiff and sore, her back shooting with occasional bursts of pain, aching, ill-used muscles protested even the slightest degree of movement. For a moment, Tsune dared to hope that if she closed her eyes and ignored all of this, she might somehow manage to fall back asleep and win a few more hours of respite from the unrelenting misery of consciousness. The pressure in her bladder refused to leave her mind, however, and her gut chose to rumble ominously a few seconds later. Muttering a virulent oath, Tsune reluctantly pushed herself up off of the futon, still wearing the clothes she had fallen asleep in, stale and smelling of bile and liquor, the legendary sucker groaned and rose to her feet, feeling bones creak and joints crack. She staggered blearily in the direction of the bathroom, after taking care of business and doing a quick wash, rinsing her face and brushing her teeth, she finally bothered to check the time. It was half past three, in the afternoon, ugh, that was a hell of a night, the woman groaned, feeling half again as old as she actually was, she rubbed her eyes, which felt dry and vaguely itchy, blee, I'm seriously getting too old for this crap, sighing, Sunaid left the bathroom in search of a clean change of clothes, it took her a moment to find her things, she couldn't really remember checking into this inn, and the layout was a little different than she was used to, she found Shizun's clothes before her own, actually, and this led her to wonder just where her apprentice might have gotten to. She'll probably be doubly insufferable today, the lush thought ruefully as she passed over the raven-haired woman's bag and came to her own. Considering how late I've slept in, she pinched the bridge of her nose, feeling her headache intensify. Fuck, I must have had a lot to drink last night. Shizun was usually fairly deferential to her master, especially since the women might as well have been her aunt, but that didn't mean she never expressed disappointment with Tsunade's lifestyle. While she rarely said as much outright, Shizun rather disapproved of drinking and gambling, and could even become something of a nag if pushed far enough, they were as good as family, and this meant the apprentice medic was one of the few people who could get away with busting Tsunade's balls over her bad habits, so to speak, finally coming across a serviceably clean change of clothes, Tsunade peeled off her crusty and stinking garments, she paused for a moment, debating whether to take a bath now or get dressed and wait until she didn't feel so ungodly horrible. Most of her being just wanted to lie back down on the futon and wait for the hangover to pass. Even getting dressed felt almost like it would be more trouble than it was worth. But Shizun would probably have a conniption if she came back to find her mentor sleeping in the nude, and Tsunade really didn't feel like getting a lecture from the girl. Not with a headache this bad. So, with a lancifering sigh, the slug princess blearily dressed herself. As she pulled up her pants, she absently tried to remember where she was. It was a futile effort, though the last town she could actually remember the name of, the last time she'd been sober enough to commit as much to memory, had probably been a few days ago, at the very least, and who knew how far she might have wandered in the meantime. Drowsily shaking her head, Sunaid fumbled with her blouse for a moment or two, now that she'd been up for a little while, she was starting to regain her equilibrium, and managing to shunt aside the discomfort of the hangover. Learning when and how to ignore pain was a critical element of shinobi discipline, and Sunaid wasn't considered a living legend for no reason. Finally, she was dressed, and in enough control of her faculties to wonder once again, where Shizun might have gotten to. Perhaps the girl had found herself a nice guy to shack up with for the night. It would probably do her good, but Tsunade doubted that this was the case. More likely Shizun was busy doing odd jobs to try and recoup a portion of her mentor's losses. Tsunade might have been hemophobic, but her apprentice had no such hang-ups, and she was a good enough medic besides to handle most sorts of injuries and ailments. So, basically, the girl could be anywhere in the town which was troublesome, since Tsune didn't even know what town this was. Sighing, she shook her head and decided to find out if this place had an onsen. She could always look for Shizun later, and the thought of a nice hot soak was growing too tempting to ignore. So she put away her things and headed in the most likely direction of the front desk. Temery was sore, grumpy, and tired as she stumbled out of the room she and her brothers were sharing for the duration of their stay in the village, at one of Kanoha's nicer inns. It was one of those places with a hot spring natural or otherwise, she didn't care, and the blonde fully intended to take advantage of this particular amenity. Water wasn't especially scarce in Suna, the village was built above a decently sized aquifer you see, 
and the surrounding oasis locations, were well documented, but bathing was still a luxury, and one in which even the Kazakhidge's daughter could only rarely indulge. The hidden leaf had water to spare, though, so Temeri was not about to turn down the chance to enjoy a nice onsen. It wasn't Yugakure by a long shot, but Kanoha was still said to have some damn nice springs, practically melting already at the thought of getting to immerse herself in the hot, steaming mineral water. Temeri was naturally a little distracted from looking where she was going, so much so, in fact, that she wound up walking Fassa first into someone's chest, a very buxom someone's chest. Afst Murphle, Temeri yelped, eyes going wide when they were suddenly assaulted by a soft and creamy expanse. She felt her cheeks burn, and for a brief moment she froze. Then, anxiously, the lass extricated her face from the stranger's cleavage, looking away and fighting the urge to blush. She couldn't bring herself to meet the woman's eyes, she felt so mortified. Ah, eh sorry miss, she said at length, sheepishly scratching the back of her neck. I wasn't watching where I was going, no problem, kid, the woman replied, her words coming out the slightest bit slurred, just tell me if this place has a hot spring, and we'll call it even, Temery blinked owlishly at this, um yes, she said in spite of herself, managing to turn her head and lift her gaze to meet the woman's eyes, she straightened up and recomposed herself, it does, I was just heading there now in fact, oh, that's good, you can show me where they are then, Temery inwardly grimaced at this, her cheeks still felt a bit warm from embarrassment over that collision, and she really wanted nothing more than to put some distance between herself and this woman and forget that it had ever happened, but she couldn't quite bring herself to backtrack now. Sure, I suppose so, she reluctantly said, she took in the stranger's brown eyes, blonde pigtails, and large, tracks of land. Then she noticed the strange blue diamond mark on the woman's forehead. Oddly, Temery got the damnedest feeling that she should know who this person was. Hey, what are you guys doing here? Kiba glowered at Naruto and Sasuke, the Inuzuka halfway through undressing when the pair walked into the changing room. Neither boy spared him a second glance, simply grabbing a couple clean towels before starting to take off their own clothes. They're probably here to use the hot springs, Shino blandly deduced, his pale skin pockmarked with many minuscule, scarcely noticeable boreholes. Why else would they come in here? They might try to peep on Hinata, Kiba protested scowling. I bet they heard Kuni sensei was treating our team at the hot springs and decided to come over and perv on them. Sasuke rolled his eyes. We didn't even know your team was here until you said that, idiot he said. For all Naruto and I knew, you and Shino just came here of your own accord, not quite true, Naruto corrected his teammate, unzipping his trousers. I'd already sensed their chakra before we even entered the building, he paused, then, looking off into the distance for a moment, before adding. And speaking of which, actually, I think Sakura and Hinata must be saying hello. They're standing right next to each other. And it feels like they're talking. Kiba's scowl darkened. HMPH. Just don't try anything funny. You got that, he muttered, eyeing the pair suspiciously. I don't want either of you creeps peeping on them. I don't peep, said Sasuke scornfully. Such juvenile chicanery is beneath me, and I don't really have to peep, added Naruto helpfully. Sexy Jutsu, remember, I can make my shadow clones look like anyone he then laughed. Not that I've ever actually done that of course, he added with a jovial wink. You haven't said Kakashi, choosing now to come meandering into the changing room after his students. Well, that seems like a waste of a clever technique, Sasuke snorted. Naruto laughed. Shino didn't do anything of particular note. Kiba grumbled a bit, unamused, but he seemed to relax somewhat at the sight of an apparent authority figure. Perhaps he thought Kakashi would be a responsible adult and make sure none of the kids tried to peep through the divider or else, that the Jounin's presence would deter his students from any untoward activity. Whatever the case, he hung up his clothes and wrapped a towel around his waist. Your sensei treating you here, he ventured to say after a moment, addressing Naruto and Sasuke without actually looking in their direction. He had no way to know what stage of undressing they were at, and no desire to get a sudden eyeful. Something like that, came Sasuke's voice, the words spoken lazily. His tone was unconcerned. Yeah, pretty much, Naruto agreed. His voice was closer, and a second later the blonde walked ahead of Kiba, heading towards the door. And I guess that means Kuni sensei is doing the same, right? Kiba nodded. I think she figured we deserved a reward for doing so well in the prelims. Sasuke stepped forward now, with a condescending smirk on his face. I think it's rather sad that you see landing even one hit on your opponent as doing well, he drawled. Had any trouble sitting down recently? Achiha, Kiba retorted, glowering. Sasuke scowled for a fraction of a second before smirking, I could ask your sister the same thing, Inuzuka, Kiba's face went maroon, and he grit his teeth, one could have been forgiven for thinking that sparks had begun to fly between the pair's eyes, with the intensity of Kiba's glare bordering on downright lethal, 
Sasuke was subtler in his distaste, but it was clear from the way he looked at the other genin, with a lofty and disinterested sort of contempt, that he thought of the other boy as being singularly beneath him. This unspoken dismissal chafed Kiba like leather underwear in an August marathon, raising his hackles and making him long to let one fly and knock the so-called Uchiha prodigy down a few pegs, he probably would have done something about it too, if not for the voice that broke in on their stereodown. Be nice now boys, Kakashi boredly interjected, walking past them in a towel of his own, a washcloth wrapped around the lower half of his face. He gave his student a look, don't get all snippy just because a Kamaru bit you, Sasuke, really, that was just your own fault for letting your guard down, Sasuke scowled at this comment, and for a moment the look in his eyes made it seem like he would continue antagonizing Kiba just to spite his sensei, but then he stopped and shook his head, giving the Inazuka one last dismissive look before turning and following Naruto out into the hot spring. Kiba reluctantly stood down, muttering under his breath about insufferable pricks, before heading out into the open-air bath as well. Shino sighed and shook his head lanceringly. A Kamaru was busy being pampered by Hana back at the Inazuka kennels. What sort of training do you plan on doing for the finals, Hinata? Sakura's question was not spoken very loudly, but neither were the words vocalized with any particular quietness. It was a perfectly innocent and casual inquiry, the kind of talk that wouldn't draw more than a single cursory glance from the other patrons. Hinata sank into the water, leaning her back against the fence which divided the men's and women's sides of the hot spring. She smiled idly as the pinkette took a spot beside her, a spot which just so happened to be right in front of a small, almost unnoticeable hole in the wood. There weren't too many people here, the time being scarcely four in the afternoon, and aside from her, Sakura, and Kuni sensei there were only a couple other women in the water, do you mean aside from general physical conditioning, she wondered, smiling blissfully as she melted into the water. I don't know, but I've considered working on my Shoryuken. I still can't shape the chakra on that one quite as quickly as I would like, you see, but then, there are also a couple other moves I've been conceptualizing, mm, neat, Sakura hummed drowsily, sinking a little further into the water. Anything interesting? Well, I do have an idea for, sort of forming a fireball with my hands and shooting it out with a palm thrust, Hinata said but it's pretty tricky, and I haven't made much progress, really, it's mostly just a theoretical exercise at this stage, too bad, Sakura said, chuckling lazily, I would have liked to see you tossing around some new moves in the final phase, Hinata giggled, patting Sakura on the shoulder, what about you, she queried, I'm sure you won't be sitting idly by while your teammates train themselves raw, true, true, Sakura laughed high and clear, earning her a dirty look from a familiar sandy blonde at the other end of the spring, Temeri of Suna whose middle brother Sakura had quite soundly defeated in the preliminaries. Yes, well, you know me. Kakashi-sensei is planning to have us start on chakra nature transformation, I think. But as for my personal training I'll probably just be working on my medical ninjutsu and practicing my chakra control. You know, to try and squeeze a little bit more power out of my punches. Another blonde, older and more buxom than Temri, perked up the tiniest bit at this. Hinata noticed, and she smiled inwardly. I can hardly fathom how you could punch any harder than you already do, Sakura, the Hyruga lass said demurely, watching for the older woman's reaction. Your strength is already just monstrous, to be absolutely frank, Sakura shrugged. Hey. It's the difference between reducing someone to a chunky salsa and turning them into a fine paste, really, the pinkette said, but you never know what sort of nigh indestructible freaks might be out there. More likely than not I'll need every newton of punching power I can muster, one day, probably, Hinata conceded smiling genially, but I think your medical ninjutsu is a more valuable skill in the long run. Who else will keep Naruto and Sasuke from dying of combat injuries, if not you, he? Perhaps, perhaps, said Sakura with a knowing smile, she waved a hand airily and winked, those two truly are hopeless without someone there to patch up their wounds, her smile sharpened, then, and emerald eyes gleamed. Speaking of the boys, by the way, has Naruto invited you to that family reunion he's got planned yet? Sasuke's already invited me to his, she added, puffing out her chest and grinning wider, but of course he has, Hinata said gracefully, he's very eager to meet his family you know, since he didn't really have anyone there for him growing up, the blonde woman from earlier twitched a tiny bit at this comment, true, both our boys are poor, sad orphans aren't they, Sakura giggled, I suppose that's why they need our tender affections to make their lives worthwhile, oh, really now, Hinata splashed Sakura, laughing, are you sure you weren't the one mooning over Sasuke ever since your early days in the academy, Look at the pot calling the kettle black, said Sakura loftily, poking a finger into Hinata's side. Like you've never used that keki jenkei to get a peek of your crush in the buff, Hinata smiled demurely. I'm sure I have no idea what you are talking about, Sakura, she replied, reclining a little more against the divider. 
Are you sure all this steam isn't going straight to your head? So you're saying you've never peeped on a boy you liked? Sakura teasingly inquired. Ever of course not, said Hinata primly. Sakura smirked, her eyes twinkling. She turned so that her side was to the fence, and she peeped at the small, innocuous knothole, which rested roughly at her eye level. With a playful expression, she drew Hinata's attention to the opening. You don't feel even remotely tempted to scope out any of the cute guys who may or may not be on the other side of that fence, she whispered, waggling her eyebrows. Not even the tiniest bit, not at all, Hinata assured her friend. Sakura laughed. Well then, I guess that just means all the more for me red heart. She chirped, and after saying this, the pinkette promptly turned and put her eye to the knothole, a rather lecherous grin adorning her lips. A second later, she pouted, Oh darn, all I see is an eye. This statement, unlike most of the rest of their conversation, was loud enough to be heard by the rest of the patrons. On the other side of the fence, Shino was dragging an unconscious Kiba out of the water. Naruto was pinning Sasuke to the spot with a stern look, deterring the Uchiha from trying to succeed where the Inuzuka had failed. Please don't kill my godfather, that look said, and Sasuke, despite his indignation at the thought that the Toad Sage might even now be getting an eyeful of his wife's naked form, regardless of the fact that Jiraiya would rather be focused on any mature patrons who might be in the women's side of the hot, spring, reluctantly acquiesced to Naruto's wish. Kakashi wasn't stupid enough to try and get between Jiraiya and his research. Shino was too busy making sure his insensate friend didn't drown, and the few other male patrons seemed largely indifferent. Naruto was patient, and besides, that he could feel Sakura's chakra on the opposite side of the fence, most likely blocking any view Jiraiya might want to get with the back of her head, so he didn't feel any need to act just yet. If Hinata was in any danger of being peeped on, then he might jump in and give the old pervert what for, but for now he just wanted to sit there and appreciate the fact that his former mentor was honest to God, truly and sincerely alive, right there in front of him. Also, he knew it was only a matter of time until Jiraiya was caught. Sakura was of course aware of the man's presence Naruto had informed her the instant he realized that the onsen they were going to happen to be the current location of a chakra signature that could only have belonged to his godfather, with its size and density and minutest, oily trace of intermingled natural energy. Sakura probably just wanted to enjoy her bath a bit before actually calling the man out, not that saying this would have calmed Sasuke, or have stayed Kiba from his doomed attempt to kick the peeping Tom's ass. So Naruto sat, and soaked, and waited, once Jiraiya had been forcibly torn from his research, then he would approach the man about training him for the Chunin exams. If all else failed, he could just play up the resemblance to his parents and guilt trip the old ninja into teaching him. At that moment, a twinge of visceral, reflexive panic reached the blonde's empathic senses. His ears perked up, and he listened more closely to what was being said on the women's side. Comma, all I see is an eye, Naruto chuckled, then, moments later, feeling the swell of righteous anger from a very familiar chakra. Jiraiya, he thought he, recognizing Tsunade's furious roar. Nice to have you back, granny. The onsen all but exploded, and Jiraiya let out a most unmanly shriek as the fence flew straight into his face, but I should probably rescue Pervy Sage before you put him six feet under. With that weary thought, Naruto grabbed the toad summoner's arm and drew up a minuscule sliver of Kurama's chakra. In a flash of gold light, he and Jiraiya vanished. Kakashi blinked owlishly, even as he and the remaining men present stared in a mixture of terror, awe, and fascination as a livid tsunade stormed heedless of decency across the point where the divider had stood only a second before. Startled bathers on both sides ducked low into the water, abashed of being seen naked by the opposite sex, only tsunade seemed unconcerned, whipping her gaze over the men's half of the bath for several seconds, searching for her perverted former teammate. The more lecherous bathers on the men's side sent up prayers of gratitude, while the saner ones prayed for mercy. Tsunade threw her head back and howled to the heavens in her rage. Jiraiya, she bellowed, ah, I am going, to kill you. The instant Jiraiya saw that bright green eye looking back at him, he knew he was screwed, and not in the fun way either. What started out as an excellent day seemed to have very quickly gone downhill. When that pink-haired girl took a seat right in front of the hole in the fence, a formerly most splendid view was reduced to nothing but an eyeful of cherry blossom hair, and when she turned around to look through the knot hole only to see his eye, Jiraiya knew instantly that he'd been found out. It wasn't the first time he'd been caught peeping, and unless he died within the hour it likely wouldn't be the last, but the explosion that had followed her exclamation, water erupting into the sky as though gravity had been temporarily reversed, air screeching in his ears as a gale force wind tore through the onsen, had been worrying. The shout that accompanied that violent event was even worse, he knew the voice well, even after all these years being able to identify it immediately, and the sound of it filled him with absolute dread. Considering that he'd almost died the last time he'd heard that voice filled with that much fury, 
Jiraiya could perhaps be forgiven for freezing up like a deer in the headlights, the divider being blown from its place and slammed forcibly into his face certainly didn't help matters, he'd flown clear across the men's side of the spring before he could even react, the fence splintered as he slammed into rock, and Jiraiya had just enough presence of mind to appreciate the terrible and yet glorious sight in front of him, before closing his eyes and praying it would soon be over, but then a small hand clapped on his shoulder, followed by a lurch in his gut as he was bodily dragged away at what felt like an incredible speed, wind smacked his face and tore at his towel, g-forces squashing most of his internal organs down into the bottom of his abdominal cavity, if his mouth had been open, he probably would have swallowed a lungful of flies, for a single, terrifying moment, Jiraiya worried that Tsunade had spirited him away to be taken care of where no witnesses were present, then he decided, a moment later, that she would have just beaten him to death where they stood, and damn the consequences, a second after being abducted from the onsen, Jiraiya was plopped down on the ground, and in the second and a half that it took for his eyes to reopen, when he registered that he wasn't in any immediate danger of being painfully eviscerated, his captor was apparently able to return to the hot springs, retrieve their respective clothes, and then come back without getting so much as a single hair out of place, not that anyone would have noticed, with that untidy golden mop, it took three seconds of staring to register that, yes, those were Minato's eyes staring at him out of Kushina's face, Minato's hair and skin stretched over a distinctly Uzumaki bone structure, and the smile had a little of both, Kushina's brash and irrepressible mirth glowing with Minato's warmth and quiet confidence, he knew immediately who this was, standing in front of him and depositing both of their outfits onto the ground, there wasn't anyone else it could be, such a powerful resemblance could only come from direct, immediate relation, and only one person in the world was so closely and equally akin to both Minato Namakaze and Kushina Uzumaki, comma Niruto he said, frankly dumbstruck at running into the kid like this, the one and only, the blonde cheekily replied, though a couple of people also know me as Menma, and you must be Jiraiya, I've heard an awful lot about you, ah, I see, Jiraiya mumbled, still a little bit in shock, he shook himself dry, and moved to put his clothes back on, how much have you heard, exactly, Kakashi sensei mentioned that you taught my dad, Naruto replied, a mischievous twinkle in his eye, who taught him in turn, a grin that showed far too many teeth, also, that you're my godfather, me and my teammates may or may not have been plying him with liquor at the time, Jiraiya paused, yeah, I taught your dad, and your dad taught Tsukumo's brat, he said neutrally, sidestepping the comment about him being Naruto's godfather and pulling up his trousers, then he hummed thoughtful, but Kakashi's your Janin instructor huh? he must be teaching you kids all sorts of tricks, well, he is starting us on elemental affinities, Naruto said with a laugh, haphazardly tossing on his own clothes, so I guess that's a thing, Jiraiya cocked an eyebrow at this, really, that's some pretty advanced stuff for fresh genin, he remarked, although he didn't say it with any particular hint of disapproval, I suppose he's tested your affinities, then, Naruto nodded, Sakura's got earth and water, he said matter-of-factly, dual affinities he said, wow that's rare, what, does she have a bloodline limit or something, or something, Naruto chuckled, not that it's really that impressive next to me or Sasuke, haha, <laughs> he's got quintuple affinities, he paused, and stroked his chin, unless you count Yin and Yang too, but almost everyone can use at least one of those, can't they, so I don't think many people do, Jiraiya's eyes bugged out of their sockets, quintuple, he exclaimed, immediately thinking of Nagato, the poor kid, yeah Naruto said, as though this wasn't any big deal, claims it's because of that fancy eye he's got, that Rinnegan of his, Jiraiya felt like he must have been suffering a mild stroke at that moment, I'm sorry, I don't think I heard you correctly, he said slowly, gaping in spite of himself, it almost sounded like you said Rinnegan, that would probably be because that's exactly what I said, Naruto cheerfully quipped, not like it means all that much though, he's still only the second strongest genin on team 7, what? The kid who apparently possesses a daojutsu so powerful that the last man to wield it was considered a physical god is only the second strongest genin on your squad, Jiraiya said disbelievingly, what, hell, don't tell me that Sakura girl has Makutan or something, Naruto waved a hand dismissively, no, just stupidly monstrous physical strength and a frightening aptitude for medical jutsu he drawled, I on the other hand, am pure awesome incarnate, a beat, comma well, me and Kurama, he amended a second later, grinning sheepishly, Jiraiya blinked, Kurama, yeah, though you'd know him as Kaiubi, wouldn't you, or maybe Kaiubi, if you're using it like a proper name or title or something, Naruto beamed, he's actually not that bad a guy, once you get past all the misanthropy and indiscriminate violence, you know, he hasn't called me a puny human in years, that's real progress, Jiraiya stared at Naruto, deeply perturbed, I I see, he mumbled weakly, 
slowly shaking his head and taking a seat on the grass. Tell me Naruto, does the Kaiyu, uh, does Kurama ever, say, tell you to do things, things you wouldn't normally do otherwise? Naruto scowled at this, as though reminded of an unpleasant smell. HRM, well, he does nag me an awful lot about getting paperwork done on time, the blonde said, frowning, and he gets all fussy when I forget to wash my hands or brush my teeth, says I'm already gross enough without adding bad hygiene to the mix, Jiraiya stared, ah he said, ah is that so, that's interesting he paused, looking a touch anxious, um, is there anything else, I dunno Naruto muttered, he sometimes threatens to eat my soul and says he'll make me kill all my friends and burn down the village if I don't do as he says, but that's usually only when I forget to feed him, never actually follows through on those threats, either Jiraiya stared and stared, completely at a loss for anything else to say, feed him, he said at last, continuing to stare blankly at the lad, what, mostly fried tofu and inarizashi, Naruto elaborated, if perhaps not in the way Jiraiya wished, though sometimes I'll get him a couple oxen or a brace of wild boars if he's been good, Jiraiya opened and closed his mouth several times, trying to say something but unable to actually formulate any coherent expression of his thoughts or questions, it made him look rather like a goldfish, and no I mean, wah, how, Naruto stared at Jiraiya, looking at the man like he had just asked something patently absurd, what, isn't it obvious, no, Jiraiya wanted to say, no of course it isn't obvious, but he couldn't bring himself to actually say that, it was just too surreal a conversation to try and approach logically, and his brain refused to even try and apply any sort of sense or reason to Naruto's statements, so instead he decided to try and steer the conversation in a direction, where he could be the expert, and not the gawking imbecile, yes, yes of course he said, a mix of dismissive and evasive all in one, well if you're really on as good terms with Kurama as you say you are, then I suppose it should be safe for you to learn how to use it, um, his chakra Naruto cocked his head to one side, I think I've already got a pretty good hang of that actually, Sasuke and Sakura helped me out a lot with figuring out the specifics, and then he clapped his hands together, literally lighting up with a shroud of inhumanly dense chakra, the boy was clad in flames of gold, a raiment of light tattooed with arcane markings, grass grew greener and springier at his feet, and the air tasted somehow cleaner, fresher, alive with something pure and primeval, Jiraiya blinked, Naruto smiled innocently, how's this, he inquired, comma, how do you feel about toads, kid, Jiraiya asked, he hadn't felt this eager to teach someone since back when Minato had been his student, it seemed that, in at least one aspect, Naruto took after his father more than his mother, they're awesome, of course, Naruto glibly responded, almost as great as hot babes, the grin that followed nearly threatened to split Jiraiya's face in half, I think we're going to get along famously, said the toad sage, hopefully Kakashi won't mind me abducting you for a bit of private tutoring, I'm sure he won't Naruto replied, where on earth is Naruto Kakashi wondered with a frown, sporting a heck of a shiner over his transplanted shiringan and a sizable hematoma under his messy silver bedhead, he looked around in the onsen, swiveling his head this way and that as he scanned the waters for the short, cocksure blonde, an earthen barrier decorated with canine visages courtesy of the copy ninja split the men's and women's sides of the hot spring, functioning in lieu of the fence Tsunade had shattered, several of the bathers on this side of the spring were dazed and glassy-eyed, either haunted or delighted by memories of Tsunade's brief rampage, unlike Kakashi, most of them were physically untouched, the civilian bathers having been smarter than to try and get in the furious Kunoichi's way, Kakashi himself had only intervened out of reflex, and not any actual conscious decision, if he'd been thinking straight, he would have simply laid low and waited for the storm to pass, and all his attempt to stop Tsunade had really accomplished, anyways, was to mildly inconvenience the one woman stampede for a second or two, Thankfully, Sakura and Sasuke had managed to pick up their senseis slack and intercept the blonde ballistic missile, before she could do any serious damage to him. Between a crimson look from Sasuke, and a seemingly gentle touch from Sakura, the legendary Kunoichi was handily stopped in her tracks. If Kakashi focused, he could even now hear his female student on the other side of the impromptu new divider, expertly, soothing and defusing the pissed, hung over Tsunade the only one of his students to have not played a role in stopping the furious woman's brief but devastating rampage was Naruto, who had seemingly vanished into thin air, looking sidelong at the last touch of her, Kakashi again idly wondered where Naruto might have gotten to in the few seconds of chaos that had erupted following Tsunade's initial outburst, it did not escape his notice that Jiraiya, whose peeping habits were responsible for the blonde's eruption, was also nowhere to be seen, this didn't necessarily mean that there was a connection, mind, but to completely dismiss the possibility would have been imprudent. He probably slipped away with his godfather said Sasuke. He was boredly searching the water for his towel, which had come undone in the recent confusion, 
much to Sakura's audible delight amusement when she saw it, I noticed they both vanished shortly after the fence came down, I doubt that's a coincidence, Kakashi sighed, wondering for the umpteenth time whether it had really been prudent to let that particular detail in regards to Jiraiya's relation to Naruto slip when he had, yes, that does seem likely, doesn't it, he murmured, but it would have been nice to receive a heads up before he went and stole one of my pupils, I'd been planning on teaching him a new technique, and maybe Sakura too, Sasuke gave Kakashi a look, arching one of his eyebrows, and me, you already copied my reikiri, Kakashi said, sounding just a tad petulant, I don't even know how you did that, either, considered how much fog there was, but, he scowled and crossed his arms over his chest, even aside from the fact that Sasuke had copied it at all, it was also a tad irksome that the boy could already perform the techniques on hand seals, and a seemingly indefinite number of times per day, at that, Kakashi was finding it surprisingly easy to understand why so many people had resented the Uchiha and the Shiringan, back before the night total annihilation of both, a scholar of literature probably could have written an entire essay on all the levels of irony of the copy ninja being annoyed over having his one, original, signature killing move copied by his own damn student, but Kakashi wouldn't have cared about that, he didn't much feel like being reasonable on that matter, Sasuke shrugged, my eyesight's better than yours, he replied dismissively, this was only a half lie, with the eternal main Jekaiyo Shiringan and all the utter hacks of his one Irinigan, Sasuke really did have an absurd degree of visual acuity, surpassed in range and in sight only by masters of the Byakugan. Of course, the real reason he could use his sensei's only original jutsu was obviously because he had learned it from the man himself more than 20 years ago. But the battle on the bridge, where Kakashi had employed that jutsu to counter and Sunder's abuser's executioner blade, pestered into pulling out all the stops so as to keep from being completely shown up by his students had provided Sasuke with a golden opportunity to claim to have seen and copied it, a perfect excuse for being able to use the jutsu, which he could vaguely recall learning some time not long before Itachi's return to Konoha. Some details faded with time, but Sasuke's memory of having his chidori blocked and arm broken by his older brother was still quite vivid, a mixture of the Shiringan's edetic memory, and the tendency of certain aspects of traumatic events to remain starkly clear in the mind even years after the fact. HMPH. Well whatever, Kakashi muttered peevishly, sinking back into the water, he sighed, if those two really did escape together, then I bet it's only a matter of time before Naruto guilts Lord Jiraiya into teaching him a few new jutsu, anyways, look on the bright side, Sasuke said, gesturing vaguely with his one hand, if he takes over training Naruto for the Chunin exams, that'll leave you with more time to show me and Sakura some useful tricks, Kakashi huffed, still feeling a bit sore over possibly losing the chance to teach his sensei's son the Rasengan. In another time he wouldn't have been too bothered, having thought Naruto unprepared and too immature to learn such a jutsu so early anyways, but in this iteration he honestly believed that the kid was as ready as he'd ever be to learn his father's original technique. Sakura is a very bright girl, he muttered after a few seconds of bullheaded silence, I suppose she could probably manage something like the water dragon jutsu without too much trouble, and I did copy a fair few dotten techniques at the tail end of the war, and as for me, Sasuke prompted, eyeing his sensei expectantly. I've seen what you can do with that daojutsu of yours, Kakashi flippantly replied, waving a hand airily. I'm sure you'll manage just fine with the skills you've already mastered, and it's not like you can't just copy any jutsu she might happen to use later on, Sasuke shrugged. Fair enough, he conceded, but it's not like you wouldn't do the same if you were in my position, Kakashi did not dignify this with a response. What the fuck is wrong with these Konoha bitches? This thought echoed through Temuri's brain a statement of her disbelief more than a genuine inquiry as she stared and watched one of the other genin kunoichi to advance to the finals calmly and nonchalantly talk down a homicidal, hungover tsunade, yes, tsunade, of the goddamn sanin, who had been screaming threats of murder and mutilation at a man named Jiraiya, a name that all too often went together with those of tsunade and orochimaru in the history books, Mayabakusen no gama senin, as he was said to introduce himself, too much of a coincidence to actually be an effing coincidence, at least Temri now knew why the woman's face had seemed so vaguely familiar. The slug princess was still listed in Suna's bingo books, and Chayo Basama had certainly told her and Kankuro enough rambling tales about her old rivalry with the legendary sucker to make certain details stick. It took her a moment of silent thought and a slightest hint of growing dread to appreciate the fact that no less than two of the famed Sanin seemed to be present in Kanoha, and not a month before the long-planned invasion. An invasion she was distantly aware to have planned between her father and the rogue third member of the Hidden Leaf's most legendary trio. Temeri was probably in a state of mild shock, 
standing there in the hot spring and staring at that pink-haired little freak of nature who had beaten Kankuro in the preliminaries, a rosy-tressed little medic ninja who had shrugged off the puppet expert's poisons like they were nothing and thrown him into the fire wall just by flicking him on the forehead, and who now was in the process of patiently soothing a seething tsunade, looking for all the world like she had done this a million times before. She wasn't entirely certain what, exactly, to think about this, but the general impression was pretty clear. Temeri had thought that leak had seemed absurdly fast and strong, but what she'd just seen from Tsunade's conniption fit had made the bowl cut Teijutsu freak look slow and feeble by comparison. For goodness sake, the woman had practically upended the entire onsen with a single punch, the bow wave from her fist had split the waters like a red sea, and the shock of her knuckles impacting the divider was felt in the bones of everyone present. Some of the smaller civilian women in the bath had been sent flying clear out of the water, and the towels of those who'd been closest to Tsunade when she snapped were hanging off of their frames in tatters, tossed and buffeted about by nothing but the sheer air pressure from her swift and violent movements. Temeri couldn't say for sure what was scarier, the fact that the woman had done all of this without even apparently trying, or that she'd so easily flown into a murderous rage. Temeri didn't much like the idea of being peeked at by some shifty old pervert, either, but Tsunade's reaction to the revelation of a peeping Tom had been terrifyingly disproportionate. If that was how the woman reacted to someone peeping on her in the bath, who was to say what she'd do in response to an offense actually deserving of violent retribution, like, say, her home village being invaded by traitorous allies, Temeri would not want to be present to witness such an event. And for the first time, she felt truly appreciative of the orders Baki Sensei had relayed to her and her brothers only a few hours earlier, just before the start of the surprise preliminary round. Remember, until such a time as you are instructed otherwise, you three are to act under the assumption of continuing to honor our village's treaties with Kanoha, respect the local authorities, and do nothing to provoke unnecessary conflict or hostility. Kankuro had been visibly perplexed by these seemingly redundant instructions, and Gara hadn't looked like he was paying attention at all. But Temeri got the subtext, especially when Baki then added, Lord Kazakich has seen fit to indefinitely postpone all of your previous standing missions for the duration of our time here in Kanoha. Be grateful, it was an ambiguous enough statement to not draw any undue suspicion from those not in the know, but clear enough also to be understood by those with the proper background information. Heaven only knew why their father had made this decision, but Temeri and her brothers had only one standing mission that could be indefinitely postponed the role which had been planned for them to play out in the invasion of Kanoha, and considering the fact that Gara's part in the plot was kind of seriously crucial to actually pulling the whole thing off, there was only one conclusion she could draw. New intelligence must have surfaced which put the integrity of the operation into serious question intelligence worrisome and ought to warrant potentially calling off the whole shebang. Intelligence for instance such as the presence of two of the legendary Sanin in Kanoha, just hanging around in the village for no apparent reason. That would certainly be a big enough factor to potentially make it too risky to go ahead with the invasion plans. Temeri could appreciate that, especially after seeing what one of them could do without even trying. I am so glad I don't have to live with these crazy freaks, she decided. They make Gara look almost normal in comparison, and that was the scariest thing she'd thought in years. When Shizuna woke to a throbbing headache and a pair of arms wrapped around her waist, she wasn't sure whether to feel glad or dismayed. On one hand, Considering that she was lying naked in an unfamiliar bed with a warm and distinctly male body spooning her, the heretofore ruefully single woman was secretly feeling a hint of cautious elation. Her aunt Charge, and mentor may have been content to live the life of a bachelorette wandering from town to town in a drunken haze, but Shizun had lately become increasingly aware of the fact that, in close to 25 years of life, she herself had not once had any kind of serious romantic relationship. She wasn't a little girl anymore, and all those years she'd spent traveling with Tsunade, focusing so heavily on just looking after the older medic and making certain she didn't get herself into too much trouble, had done very little for Shizun's personal life, just being able to wake up in a stranger's bed after a night spent drinking felt strangely freeing, for once she'd had a chance to forget about being the responsible one and actually have a good time herself, all thanks to being back in Kanoha, on the other hand however, considering that she was lying naked in an unfamiliar bed with a warm body curled up behind her, Shizun also felt a more than a little embarrassed, she had no idea who the person spooning her was, and while she may not have been at all averse to the thought of hooking up with a nice, handsome fellow, she wasn't half so desperate for a meaningful relationship as to hop into bed with the first guy to offer, at least, she hoped she wasn't, but she'd seen firsthand what alcohol could do to the judgment of even very intelligent and respectable people, and there was no guarantee that the man embracing her was someone she would have any serious interest in while sober, hesitantly, gingerly, Shizun pried the hands off of her waist and inched a little towards the edge of the bed. She pulled the covers off of herself and sat up, turning hesitantly to glance at the man whose bed she was sharing. 
For a moment, she just looked and stared at the dusky complexion, brown hair, scarred nose, and peacefully sleeping face. She drank it all in, feeling a twinge of appreciation. He was handsome, she noted, in a non-threatening and almost boyish sort of way, with lips that looked well suited to smiling, and a toned but lean musculature, which seemed to hint at a possible shinobi background. Cheeks grew warm after a few moments of staring at the man, and Shizuna bashedly tore her gaze away before it could drift too far south. Well, he definitely looks very nice, she murmured to herself, and trying very hard not to look back in her bedmate's direction, she cast an eye around the room in search of her clothes. Hopefully Tsunade Sama hasn't gotten into too much trouble while I was away, she thought, reaching up to snag her panties from the ceiling fan, though I'm sure she won't be very happy when she realizes where we are. She spared another glance for the man she'd apparently slept with and smiled a touch guiltily as her gaze wandered more freely over his form, ruefully thinking for the briefest of moments that maybe she shouldn't have left her mentor all alone at that inn, because who knew what sort of trouble the woman might be getting into. Naturally, Iruka chose then to wake up and open his eyes to see Shizun standing over him in the buff, her dark eyes glued half longingly and half regretfully to his naked body. It was terribly awkward for both of them. It was to grey skies and a light drizzle that Itachi Uchiha awoke that morning. His eyes opened and he sat up, rising into consciousness with an uncanny ease. He was instantly alert, though not tense or nervous. Quiet confidence was mingled with just a hint of clear caution. No cue of drowsiness or stupor was there to be seen in his visage as he arose from his sleeping bag, dressed ready for a fight, shooting coolly wary glances hither and yon. He stood and swept up his sleeping bag with a single fluid motion, packing it automatically and mechanically. Languidly he assessed his surroundings, analyzing and mentally cataloging every tiniest detail with sharp crimson eyes. Rain clouds drifted overhead, casting a dismal pall over the lowlands of river country, wet and runny ashes, the only remnants of a smokeless cook fire from the previous night, were washing away in tiny rivulets, a damp, pervasive chill hung in the air, numbing fingers and stiffening joints, small and beady eyes, greeted the Uchiha's rising, pale blue lips curling into a sharp-toothed smile. Did you have a good night's rest? Itachi-san, Kisei Mishigaki, politely inquired. The serenity of the man's expression evoked an eerie dissonance as he stroked the death's head pommel of a thickly swaddled greets ward, the picture indicative of an erich disconnect between his monstrous visage and courteous mien. Good enough, Itachi curtly replied. How did your watch go? Well enough, Kisei answered, wryly mimicking Itachi. This is a quiet country, and nothing much comes up in this sort of weather besides. Samehada and I haven't caught whiff of anything larger than a squirrel all night. The shark-like man patted the hilt of his gigantic weapon. Itachi nodded, wordlessly showing his understanding. Silence reigned between them for a minute or so as one sat and waited for the other to finish cleaning up his half of the camp. Have you eaten yet? The raven-haired youth asked at length, once he had sealed away his sleeping bag and combed the site for any overt traces of their presence. Water dripped from the rim of his straw hat as he adjusted it on his head. Just a food pill and the last piece of venison jerky, said Kasame. We should still have a few pounds of dried fruit and plenty other rabbit food, though, unless you've been doing a bit of midnight snacking during your watches, Itachi hummed and nodded. Yes, that sounds about right. Those supplies should be more than enough to last us until we meet up with our client, he said, comma, even discounting the food pills are, yes, our client, Kasame heartily chuckled, standing and slinging Samehada over his shoulder. It has been quite a while since I've done a straightforward escort mission like this, and to the Chunin exams, of all destinations, he grinned, showing off a considerable number of teeth, quite generous of the old fellow really, wouldn't you say, especially when he could have contracted a team of ninja from his country's own hidden village, which Ipa was Itachi's response, terse but accurate, shrugging, Kisame turned and started off, knowing that his partner would catch up in just a second. Do you suppose there will be any talents worth scoping out at these exams? The former Miss Jounin wondered. I don't think I have been to one since my own. Itachi was quiet. It was clear from context and his knowledge of Kasame's personality that by talents worth scoping out, the man meant people who might be worth fighting at some future point in time. Unbidden, Itachi's mind went to the contents of a certain letter, drawing up from memory the date of a certain function announced therein. He thought of his little brother, whom he had spared from death what felt like a lifetime ago, and who had seemingly sent him that very letter quite out of the blue. Maybe a few, he said ambiguously. Kasame grinned, spying the pensive look on his partner's face. Hey he, is that so? Mm, then perhaps this one genin team I've heard about will be there, he mused. Do you remember them? Those children who supposedly sent my former colleague, Zabuza San, slinking back to Kiri with his tail between his legs, Itachi looked off into the distance. The wind shifted, rustling their cloaks and flecking their faces with a light smattering of cool raindrops. Ah, I believe I know who you're talking about, he decided to say. 
that's the team with the Kaiubi Jinchuriki, their Janin sensei is Kakashi Hatake, my captain for a while, back when I was in Anbu, Kisame's smile widened and became aught but to opposing rows of teeth filed to unnaturally sharp points, oh is that so he murmured, dark eyes glittering with mirth, my my, my it sounds like this will be a most entertaining diversion, yes, Itachi murmured absently, yes, so it does, Hanabi Hairuga adored her big sister, this was a simple, indisputable fact as sure and self-evident as the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, grass was green, the sky was blue, and Hanabi admired Hinata, she loved her sister's kindness, how Hinata would play with her even if she was exhausted from training, how Hinata would listen to her childish worries and give her reassurance, her sister was strong, and almost always had been in Hanabi's eyes, no matter what other clan members may have thought in the past, her sister was brave and gentle and pretty, and so kind, and so strong, Hanabi had always believed her sister was amazing, that Hinata Hairuga was a remarkable person, she had always admired her own Isama, had always looked up to her and hoped to one day be every bit as wonderful a person as she was, only once or twice had that childlike faith faltered, but every time her beliefs had ultimately been vindicated, at least to her young mind, in this instance however, something was different, for the first time in a long while, Hanabi's belief in Hinata's strength was mirrored by the rest of the clan, Hinata had irrefutably proven, the day after her graduation, just how amazing a kunoichi she really was, at the time, Hanabi's faith in her sister's strength had begun to falter, she'd seen Hinata fall short in spars against Nijini Aizen, and even lose in a fight against herself as well, her, Hanabi, a girl several years Hinata's junior, it had shaken her worldview to realize, seemingly, that her sister was in fact weak, and that many among their clan viewed Hinata as unfit to assume a leadership position, while being passed over for the spot of clan head would not result in anything like getting bound with the caged bird seal, that being applied only to sons who could actually traditionally start branch families of their own, and to their children, it still seemed to Hanabi as though being passed over like that would have been a dreadful thing to happen to anyone, let alone her big sister, and for a while she'd ruefully, worriedly, regretfully thought along similar lines to the other clan members, although she still dearly loved her sister. Hinata Nisima was still Hinata Nisima, whether weak or strong, but it had nonetheless felt disappointing in a way, to think that she had surpassed her sister like this, that victory in their spa had felt hollow, tasting like ash in her mouth, Hinata could have won, should have won, she was more experienced, after all, stronger and faster than her baby sister, but she had been unable to follow through on the opening she had created, reluctant to strike her beloved sibling, even in a mere practice fight, and for a while, Hanabi had foolishly bought into the assumptions of the other clan members that this kind-heartedness, this nature of gentility and gentleness, somehow proved Hinata's weakness, that because Hinata had been unwilling to hurt her baby sister, she need must have been inadequate and incapable, insufficiently skilled to carry the mantle of the Hyuga clan's leadership, but then came that fateful day, the day when Hinata Nisama proved her strength beyond any shadow of a doubt, Hanabi had seen her sister from afar, that morning, awoken from her slumber by screams and crashing noises, what she saw, when she dared to peer out her window, utterly awed and amazed her, Hanabi Hayuga beheld her sister storming determinedly out of the compound, brushing aside dozens of full-grown branch house members each one of them a proven and experienced shinobi, like they were but minor nuisances, Hanabi recognized scarcely half of the strikes her sister used, and she gawked on in dumbstruck wonderment as Hinata completely humiliated skilled and able-bodied ninja up to twice her size and thrice her age, with this single spectacle, Hanabi Hairuga's faith in her elder sister was restored and redoubled, starry-eyed, she had watched her sister punch through the outer wall of the compound without even touching it, inwardly gushing and squeeing with relief, vindication, and a tiniest tint of shame for ever having thought to doubt her sister's prowess, since that day, Hanabi's admiration for her sister had only grown, where most of the other clan members, even her own father, to a certain extent, respected Hinata, only with an equal measure of fear, Hanabi saw no reason to shy away from her sister, or cower in her presence, whether weak or strong, Hinata Nisima was Hinata Nisima, nothing could ever change this, much though certain people might have wished otherwise, Niji Niaizen, Niji Niaizen, Hanabi cried out excitedly when she saw her cousin come walking into the clan head's house, doubtless to give a report on his progress in the Chunin exams, you're back, did you see sister, how is she, how well did she do, is she a Chunin now, are you a Chunin now, she chattered away until she was breathless, firing off this rapid barrage of questions in her excitement, she hadn't seen Neji or her sister in nearly a week, and sure Neji had been gone for similar lengths, once or twice, on a C-rank mission with his team, but the longest Hinata had ever been away from home had been two and a half days, when she and her team had gone to take care of a troublesome boar on the outskirts of a rural farming village, 
A whole week of separation seemed nearly unprecedented to young Hanabi, Neji blinked, staring blankly at his cousin, legal cousin, genetically a half-sister, since their fathers had been identical twins, but no one really counted that, but he stared at Hanabi, and his mouth creaked halfway open as if meaning to speak but unsure of what to actually say. He wasn't entirely certain how to approach Hanabi, for a variety of reasons both obvious and more subtle. Being reminded of Hinata and the tune in exams made him think of her fight with Tenten in the preliminaries, which caused him to recall that his female teammate had been snappish with him all day. Ever since his attempt at reassuring her after her defeat had backfired, and remembering this fact after having tried rather hard to forget it over the past several minutes stirred a strangely uncomfortable sensation in his gut, a sort of faint tightness in his chest, and an ill humor at the back of his mind, his lips threatened to twitch downward in a scowl, and only a near absolute control over his facial expressions on Niji's part managed to keep it from actually forming. Dimly, he wondered why it acted him as much as it did that Tenton wasn't speaking with him at present. Might it be that he felt a certain camaraderie with her, as the only other seemingly sane member of Team Guy? Shaking his head, he discarded this train of thought. Comma Hinata Sama was well, the last I saw her, he finally said, looking Hanabi mostly in the eye. His glance was a tiny bit off to the side, but otherwise it seemed sincere. And no, None of us are tuning in just yet, there's still one final phase to the exams, but that won't be for a month, there, that should be enough information to satiate the girl, inwardly nodding to himself, convinced that he would now be able to go on his way unmolested, Neji turned and made to continue further inside, only to be stopped by Hanabi's hand on his arm, he flinched at the touch, a reaction obvious enough for even an untrained civilian to notice, Hanabi seemingly ignored it, how did she do, she asked, reminding Neji once again of Hinata's match with Tenton, and the subsequent situation that had occurred between himself and the brunette as a result. Superbly he said only half more than growled, unable to keep a slight trace of bitterness out of his voice. Hanabi eyed him strangely at this remark, no doubt catching his less than pleased tone. For a moment he got the impression that the younger girl was about to make some insightful remark on his apparent bad mood, wondering perhaps if there might not be a very particular reason aside, perhaps from the rather obvious, that Hinata doing so well in the tune in exams should upset him. An Adango haired, female reason, perhaps, she didn't thankfully, at least, not in the way that a small part of Neji secretly feared. Ah, did you fail the exam? She asked, about as tactful as you could expect from a kid her age, which wasn't very, Niji's face colored the slightest bit, and this was all the answer Hanabi needed. There were times that Yugeo sincerely regretted joining the Anbu. Certainly, it was great to serve the village from the shadows and eliminate its enemies under the guise of anonymity and all that. Yes, she was proud to put life and limb on the line for the sake of the Lord Hockage and the village as a whole, but the work was hardly all sunshine and daisies. Sometimes all too often, it seemed, she had those days where it felt like she would have been better served just staying at home, like the night after the Achiha massacre. God, that one had been a waking nightmare. There were some things no man or woman should have to see, and the bloody aftermath of young Itachi's rampage had to be right at the top of that list, or maybe that one mission in the capital, when she and her team had busted those human traffickers, or perhaps deposing a genocidal regime in that one impoverished, war-torn nation. It still made her sick to her stomach to think about what some people were willing to do for a quick buck, or a little power over their fellow man. Simply despicable. But today, ah, oh, today, this, right here, had to be one of the worst missions she'd ever been forced to accept. It may not have been dirty, gruesome, or involved in any significant way with the really more abominable aspects of human nature, but it was still more humiliating and degrading than even the sleaziest of seduction gambits. Would you mind repeating that ma'am? What exactly happened in your inn's hot springs? You said something about, an explosion, correct, Yugeo Yuzuki, feeling more thankful than ever for the relative anonymity afforded to her by the porcelain mask of her Anbu uniform, held a pencil and notepad in hand as she took the innkeeper's statement, the Okami was a stooped and wizened thing, half blind, to judge by the way she was squinting, with graying hair tied up in a heavily dated fashion, and a well-kept but nonetheless very old yukata hanging off her frame. Once vibrant colors now faded into a near monochrome after decades of wear and washing. Opposite this diminutive, elderly matron, Yugeo must certainly have looked like some faceless sentinel of almighty bureaucracy, sword in sheath and pencil in hand. She most definitely felt the part, much though she wished otherwise, with the Chunin exams in full swing, she and most of her fellow Anbu had been assigned to patrolling the village, doing rounds and keeping the peace. No exciting missions for them, no. Nothing but day in, day out plodding the beat, breaking up fights and escorting drunks to holding cells, despite Kanoha being a ninja village populated primarily by individuals who were emotionally, iffy, at the best of times and capable of countless fantastic, 
frankly absurdly destructive feats, it was actually very boring most days, like, 85, 90% of the time there was never anything of note happening, even on many occasions when it seemed like there might be something interesting about to go down, it usually turned out to be just as dull and unremarkable as everything else, yes yes, it was like an explosion, said the innkeeper, gesturing vaguely with a gnarled hand, I could feel the earth shaking from inside the kitchen, and the noise, ah, it was deafening, a great, loud boom, the hole and shook from the force of it, I tell you, Yugeo nodded, absent mindedly taking notes as she thought of the nice, quiet night she had planned for her and her boyfriend, imagining how Hei it would react to seeing her in that barely their teddy had gotten her was just about the only thing giving her the will to carry on through the day's mind-numbing tedium, I see, said the violet mechanically, do you know if anyone was injured, or what exactly might have caused this explosion, no, no one was hurt, said the Okami, I don't believe so, I haven't been back there yet myself, since the explosion, but a few of the bathers have come in since then, and none of them looked any the worse for wear, only a couple of bumps and scrapes among the whole lot, you don't say, Yugeo muttered, tapping her pencil on the notepad, have any of them said anything to you about the incident, the innkeeper frowned thoughtfully at this question, she nodded silently after a moment, one or two customers did come to me with complaints of a peeping Tom and some drunk having a bit of a shouting fit on the women's side of the springs, she said, but I don't see how there could be any connection between the explosion and that, Yugeo's sweet dropped, immediately making the obvious connection, in the back of her mind, she wondered if the innkeeper might not be getting a touch senile in her old age, this was a ninja village after all, and already it seemed obvious to the Anbu operative that this whole kerfuffle had probably just been caused by an unstealthy pervert and a violently shy kunoichi, nothing suspicious or out of the ordinary there, unfortunately enough, sighing, she put away the notepad and headed in the direction of the onsen to find the persons responsible for disturbing the peace and bring them in to be dealt with appropriately by the civil authorities, a dreadfully dull task for a member of the Kanoha Black Ops, hardly challenging or engaging no matter which way you cut it, sure, it had to be done, but necessity rarely made things more enjoyable, ah, if only something interesting would happen, Yugeo thought as she stepped through the door into the hot spring, like a good old-fashioned murder mystery, perhaps, or a plot to embroil the hidden leaf in war, oh, that would be simply swell, wouldn't it, much more exciting than this, at the very least, it was with these wistful thoughts of more interesting happenings running through her mind that Yugeo Yuzuki surveyed the women's side of the hot spring, she quirked an eyebrow under her mask at the sight of an earthen wall dividing the onsen in place of the customary wooden fence, and found herself mildly surprised to recognize Kakashi's handiwork there, the dog faces were a dead giveaway, she also took note of some superficial damage to surrounding structures, and saw that the perimeter fence looked like it would probably need a fair few repairs, although it was still standing and in one piece, more or less, not even bothering to make her body language seem at all authoritative, Yugeo assessed the lingering bathers and noisily cleared her throat, ahem, she faked a cough, casting a disinterested eye over a handful of young girls, one a sandy blonde, another somewhere between blue and black, and a third with blindingly cherry blossom pink locks, she also took a moment to espy the familiar visage of Jinjutsu mistress Kuni, who looked like she was willfully and wearily closing her eyes to whatever may have been happening, the last woman of note was another blonde, and a very surly looking one at that, she was red faced and droopy eyed, with brown eyes and enormous, hands, Yugeo frowned at the sight of the woman, her expression going unseen, despite being in a bath at this very moment, this woman seemed to have something oddly untidy and disheveled about her appearance, something in the glaze of her eyes or the smell of cheap sake on her breath, which could be detected even from across the onsen, albeit very faintly, that instantly caused Yugeo to peg her as the perpeted drunk, she looked once more at the other bathers, who had all turned and now gave her their mostly undivided attention, then she blinked, looking back at the hungover looking blonde, she stared for three seconds, she looked back at the others, blinked once, looked back at the blonde, behind a porcelain visard fashioned in a vaguely animal likeness, Yugeo's mouth went slack, comma, ha, she said blankly, staring at the distinctly recognizable visage of the most legendary kunoichi to ever come out of the hidden leaf village, wow, Tsunade frowned at the Anbu operative who was standing just inside the entrance, near the edge of the spring where the stones were smooth and wet, what are you looking at, she rumbled, arms crossed above her chest, Yugeo blinked, suddenly regretting her wish for something interesting to happen, it was easy to piece together the gist of what had happened, knowing now that Tsunade of the Sanin, of all people, had been in this very hot spring when it happened, uh, she was frozen for a moment, uncertain what to say, most citizens would comply meekly if told by an Anbu to come with them, and usually those who didn't were relatively easy for the elite black op agents to subdue, but taking in someone like Tsunade, well, that was far, far, far above Yugeo's pay grade, she had no illusions that she'd be any match for the legendary medic, Anbu were good, but not that good, 
It had been quite a while since Yugeo had felt this intimidated, least of all in her own village. Sunaid narrowed her eyes. I'm not coming with you, she said flatly. I didn't do anything wrong. Yugeo wanted to curse aloud at this statement. Um, yes, be that as it may, she murmured. Well, there was a disturbance reported here at this onsen, and it's my duty to find out the cause of it. That's easy, Tsunade said flippantly. It was a peeping Tom, that damn Jiraiya. Yugeo nearly choked on her tongue at this, not at the revelation of the Toad Sage's voyeuristic habits, which were well known to most Leaf Kunoichi over a certain age, but the fact that he was here in the village at all. Tsunade was right there in front of her, and Jiraiya had been here too. Sage, Christ, and Buddha, all they needed was Orochimaru and they'd have the goddamn trifecta of what the fuck, on a private beach in the Crescent Moon Kingdom, a man in a Hawaiian shirt sneezed into his martini, taking a deep breath to keep from losing her shit because, seriously, the presence of two of the legendary Sanin in the village at the same time was big freaking news, Yugeo calmly and collectedly took out her notepad and pencil, and began to write, Jiraiya Sama, so he was the one responsible for the explosion, it was his fault it had to happen, yes said Tsunade, eyeing the Andu agent suspiciously, if he hadn't been such a pervert, Yugeo resisted the urge to sigh. It had to happen. Would you mind elaborating on that, she requested. Tsunade glowered, but did as she was asked. He was peeping on us, so of course I got angry. Like any good citizen, I made to apprehend him and give him a good scolding. The blonde scowled darkly, but he got away before I could catch him. Yugeo felt a bead of nervous sweat form on her brow. I see. So in the process of trying to apprehend him, did you do anything that might have caused damage to the onsen? She cautiously inquired, wary of invoking the medic's legendary wrath, like, oh, for instance, to the divider, HMPH. Sunade harumphed, I might have thrown it at him, but I hardly see how that's relevant. Shouldn't you be tracking him down? I don't think he's the one responsible for all this damage, Yugeo said delicately, gesturing at the splintered and barely standing perimeter fencing, the spider web cracks in the stone tiles, and the considerable volume of water which looked to have been splashed everywhere, but the spring, dousing every surface in sight and leaving the onsen barely two-thirds full. Are you really suggesting that I'm the one who will get into trouble for this? Tsunade growled, her voice low and dangerous. She made to rise from the bath, but a hand on her shoulder from the young Pinkett managed to cool her down, or at least somehow restrain her. We'll be sure to handle Jiraiya sama appropriately, Yugeo said coolly however, the matter of the damages incurred here is rather more serious. You may very well have to pay a rather hefty fine for disturbing the peace on top of financial reparations to the Kiku Shidarin. Sunade stared uncomprehendingly. Comma, what? I'm sure it was very distressing to be peeped on, Yugeo said appeasingly, but one offense does not justify another. You will have a chance to argue your case before a judge, I am sure, and Lord Hokage himself might want to handle this particular incident, considering the circumstances, but if you cooperate now, we might be able to work out a plea bargain, Sunade blinked. Her jaw was agape, and her eyes looked nearly as wide as dinner plates. The other bathers present seemed variously interested, even Kuni cocking an eyebrow at the boldness of this, Anbu. Not many people would have the balls to try and put the screws on one of the Sanin like this. The young Pinkett seemed to lean in and whisper something reassuring to Tsunade, who let out a weary, lancifering sigh in response. Yugeo herself was just praying to God that this would work. She knew that if Tsunade tried to resist arrest the there was not a damn thing she'd be able to do about it but she could hardly just turn and look the other way. This was the slug princess, the most famed medic ninja in the world, and one well known to have been avoiding Kanoha like the plague for over a decade. Honestly, by this point all of her legal talk was just a pretense to get Tsunade before the Sandame. It was practically her civic duty to ensure that Tsunade stayed in the village for as long as possible. If the woman had to be reconscripted into the hospital under the guise of community service, then so be it. Well, Yugeo asked, what do you say, Tsunade Sama? The blonde slowly shook her head and laughed, appearing grimly amused. Comma, you clever bitch, she murmured, eyeing the Anbu operative with the slightest hint of something like respect. A sigh, fine whatever, I should have known something like this was bound to happen sooner or later. She stood up and got out of the bath, sparing an unreadable glance for the pinkette who'd been beside her. A young girl Yugeo recognized as the Hyruga heiress went to the slender lass's side. Well let's go see what Saratobi sensei wants, Sunade muttered, sighing and shaking her head. Hair. With my luck this'll have all been orchestrated by Shizun in some wild plot to get me to come back here for that blasted family reunion. The Sandame stared blankly, seated in his office atop the Hockage Tower. Blink. Blink. Tsunade had her arms crossed over her chest, stubbornly looking at the wall to her left, refusing to meet her old teacher's gaze. Yugeo had already left the office at Hiruzen's request. He'd thanked the Anbu agent for bringing this matter directly to him, 
and then dismissed her and told her to take the rest of the week off, maybe spend some quality time with her boyfriend, Hockage's orders, master and pupil were in silence, the office was empty save for these two, sunlight streaming in through the window, it was a tense atmosphere, like a spring compressed in someone's hand, things were still and silent for the moment, but it couldn't last, sooner or later something would give, and then the shit would hit the fan, the Hockage sighed, he rested his chin on folded hands and closed his eyes, losing himself in rumination for a brief moment, soon Aid fidgeted, feeling like a naughty schoolgirl sitting before the headmaster, and not in the sense Jeraya would use in his novels either, even now, with his former students over 50 years old, Hiruz and Serotobi still had knack for making at least some of them feel like foolish children, neither one spoke for several seconds, they just stood there, or sat in the Sandame's case, and waited, for what, neither could really say, but they certainly weren't just procrastinating, no, perish the thought, they were just, waiting for the right moment, yeah, that's it, waiting, after a seeming age of quiet however, one of them finally broke the silence, so, yeah perhaps not an especially eloquent or Shakespearean dialogue, but it was something, it didn't convey any great meaning between them, or even begin to cover all of what they felt needed to be said, but at least it was a start, you're back in Kanoha, Hiruzen said, eyeing Sunaid curiously, that's new, I could have sworn you said, what, that you would never come here again even if it was the last civilized place on earth, to be fair, I didn't realize where I was until like half an hour ago, Sunaid responded evasively, and I'm sure I was drunk when I said that, I was definitely drunk when I came here, yes, you were, Hiruzen agreed solemnly, recalling the night in question when a grieving Sunaid had finally snapped and stormed out of town with her kidneys in tow, almost he imagined he could still detect lingering, stale traces in his nostrils of the alcoholic reek which had clung to her at that time, very drunk, for a moment, another awkward silence stretched out between them, Sunaid broke it with a sigh, I suppose you plan on charging me with property damage, she said wearily, maybe disturbing the peace too, I could feel the vibrations from here, Hiruzen remarked, idly he fingered his pipe smokeless and unlit, I have considered it, yes, Sunaid, for her part, had the decency to at least look the tiniest bit contrite, you know I hate that kind of thing, though she muttered, towing the floor and scowling, Jiraiya had it coming, mm, indeed, I will not insult your intelligence with a lecture on shinobi ethics and the illusory nature of privacy in a ninja village, said the Sandame patiently, but you did still react in a manner disproportionate to the offense, again, he got better last time, Sunaid replied, sounding a mite defensive, eventually, and that was decades ago anyways, do you really need to bring up ancient history her face colored a shade darker as she said this last bit, Hiruzen silently quirked an eyebrow, almost as if to say really, you know what I mean, she added in a huff, I'm older and wiser now, I wouldn't beat him anywhere near as badly if I caught him, is that so, her old teacher wondered, truly, Sunaid shot a black glare at him, I'll admit I should have controlled my temper, she said through grit teeth, I'm a grown woman and should know how to handle such matters civilly and responsibly, there was no call for me to do all the damage I did, or to get other people wrapped up in it, but I'll not be talked down to, Serotobi sensei, he folded his hands and nodded, fair enough, you know what you did wrong on that account, and you have acknowledged as much, that's good, aha, uh -huh. but I'm sure there's more you want to talk about, Sunaid sighed, she narrowed her eyes, right, her mentor smiled wryly, indeed there is, he said, a great deal more, leaning forward over his desk, the Lord Third looked directly into his old pupil's eyes, his lips twitched at the corners and he threaded his fingers together, an empty pipe dangled from his mouth, he spoke, his voice low and scarcely above a whisper, what would you say, to taking on a new apprentice, a Chu in the women's changing room at Kiku Shidarin and Onsen, Sakura abruptly sneezed while pulling up her panties, losing hold of the garment and dropping it around her ankles, Gesundheit said Hinata, absent mindedly fastening her bra, Sakura sniffed and rubbed her nose with a corner of the damp towel she'd been wearing, she blinked, her eyes watery, thanks she said, smiling lopsidedly at the Hyuga, I hope I'm not coming down with anything Hinata nodded her agreement, then bent over to pick up the underwear Sakura had dropped, here she said, do you need any help with that, no, I'm fine, Sakura said, thanks for offering, though Kunui watched the two girls interact with a small, nostalgic smile on her face, almost reminds me of myself and Anko, when we were that age she thought, summoning Jutsu, Naruto's proclamation rang sharp and clear, he clapped his hand down on the grass, the toad summoning scroll lay off to the side at Jiraiya's feet, a new signature drying on the ancient paper, chakra tingled in the atmosphere, thick and rich and laden with vitality, pop, I was displaced with a burst of white smoke, the blood offering from Naruto's, thumb opening the doorway for an animal familiar to pass from Mount Mayaboku to the hidden leaf, 
Jiraiya watched appraisingly as the smoke cleared, revealing a small toad of ruddy orange coloration. Yo boss, Gamakachi greeted his summoner with a wave of his webbed forelimb. What can I do you for? Then he blinked. He stared at the person before him, perplexed. Ha, ah, that was odd. Humans looked more or less the same to him, but Gamakachi was still pretty sure that Jiraiya didn't have blue eyes, or blonde hair, and the toad sage didn't usually go for such bright orange shades in his clothing either, did he? Oh, da, this wasn't Jiraiya. A eh, said Gamakachi confusedly, cocking his head to one side. Um, hello? Who are you, bro? Naruto Uzumaki said Naruto, holding a hand out to the young toad. It was weird to see his old familiar so small. He was used to being able to ride on Gamakachi's head, but at their current sizes it would be easier for Gamakachi to ride on his head. I'm new, just signed the summoning contract, we'll probably be working together for a long while, you and me. Gamakachi blinked again before giving an amphibian grin and clasping the index finger of Naruto's proffered hand. They shook, the motion looking rather odd on the human's part. Yo, Naruto, nice to meet ya, said the toad cheerfully. Gotta say, I'm a bit surprised Jiraiya actually let someone else sign the contract. Pops ought to be glad to see some new blood though. How do you get that old miser to let you sign anyways, haha? <laughs> well, it's kind of a long story, Naruto said. Chuckling sheepishly, he coughed into his fist, not so subtly changing the subject familial obligations and all that, but putting that aside, well, I'm sure it will be an honor to work alongside the toad clan of Mount Mayaboku, he bowed, briefly, before looking back up with a toothy grin, I hear you guys have some pretty incredible ninpo, Kamakuchi laughed, what, you mean our toad style senjutsu he wondered, scratching the back of his head, yeah, I suppose that's something neat by human standards, isn't it, though it's the norm for us, reckon I could try teaching ya, but pops might get fussy about that, he doesn't like any old outsiders just learning our techniques, why see, he then cocked his head to one side, spying Jiraiya standing off to the side and watching his and Niruto's interactions, oh, yo Jiraiya he called, waving to the toad sage, how you doing Jiraiya returned the greeting with a small grin, waving to the young and irreverent summon, fine he said, could probably be better, but I've just been catching up with my godson, if this statement surprised Gamakichi, the toad didn't show it, he just laughed and turned back to Naruto, hi see, so you're the Yondame's kid, Naruto smiled, you're the first person to actually come out and say it straight up, the blonde commented, silently thinking the words this time around, but yeah, I am, well, now, ain't that something, Gamakichi crowed, hopping once in place, Pops has told me stories about your old man, says the fourth Hokage was the only human he ever respected enough to consider his superior, haha, <laughs> Jiraiya's left eye twitched, the man looking up at this implied dismissal of himself as a summoner worthy of respect, he crossed his arms peevishly. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good stuff about him. People see him as some kind of hero for saving the village, I guess, Naruto said with a faint shrug. I don't know, apparently that's sort of a big deal or something, he grinned, and Gamakichi laughed. Hey, I like you bro, the toad decided. You're a real funny guy, you know that. I've always thought so, yeah. Although some people don't appreciate my brand of humor, Naruto waved a hand airily. They got all pissy when I defaced the Hokage faces and call me a pervert when I use my sexy jutsu on people, I mean, sure, I am something of a perv, but so are the people those jutsu work on, Gamakichi cocked his head curiously, Jiraiya also looked a bit intrigued by this comment, wondering perhaps what it could be referring to, sexy jutsu, he parroted curiously, yeah Naruto said, it's my pride and joy you know, my own original finishing move and saying this, he struck a pose, the ultimate forbidden technique of the Naruto Uzumaki ninja handbook, my Werok Ninpo are some of the most fearsome jutsu in all the elemental nations, he wove a ram seal and focused his chakra, see, like this, he declared, before disappearing in a puff of smoke, pop, a slow, seductive, jazzy theme might have been playing in the background as the smoke cleared, Jiraiya couldn't be sure, all he saw was that vision of erotic perfection, from her smooth, soft skin free of blemishes and shaded a healthy athletic bronze, to her hair, silky and luscious and sun-kissed gold-colored, worn in cute twin tails, she was absolutely flawless, her calves and underarms were smooth and shapely, swelling and tapering in just the right places, and with just the right proportions, her body was soft and curvaceous, with a good and toned physique underneath, lean, corded muscle could be made out across her body, if only in the subtle ways that it shaped the softer, more yielding tissues layered atop it, her thighs, her shoulders, and her lean, flat abdomen were all perfectly enticing, lewdly drawing one's gaze this way or that, perfectly framing and accentuating the most bountiful and sensual parts of her anatomy. Her posterior was goodly sized, round and bountiful, the curvature of it, in profile, 
flowed truly lasciviously from the small of her back down onto her thighs, flowing like a river into perfectly toned and proportioned legs that seemed to go for miles and miles without end. Her bosom, meanwhile, was even more generous, her breasts were big, bordering on cup sizes a quarter of the way through the English alphabet, yet also perky, while definitely looking every bit as soft and heavenly as one might imagine with their size, they did not seem to droop or sag at all. Jiraiya marveled at those beautiful bunker busters. The silence was deafening in Iruka's kitchenette, an awkward wordlessness pervading the atmosphere. Whirring and bubbling, a coffee machine dispensed its bitter payload into a waiting pitcher, the only sound audible apart from the refrigerator's dull electric hum. Iruka foraged anxiously through his pantry, looking uncharacteristically disheveled in just shorts and an undershirt. He was blushing something fierce and doing his damnedest to avoid looking into the adjacent dining room of his modest 1LDK, avoiding the conflicted and uncertain gaze of the lovely young woman he had woken up to this morning, or afternoon to be more accurate. My, and wasn't that just the most mortifying part? Iruka could not remember the last time he had ever slept so late, being an ordinarily firm believer in the age-old adage of early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. He hadn't done something like this since before he'd become a tune-in instructor, at the very least, and probably not for even longer still. Of course, Iruka didn't usually go out drinking either, but the other academy teachers had roped him into it, a celebration of the youngest and most greenhorn leaf genin squads making it past the second stage of the tune-in exams, they had called it, convincing him with some effort to come along and join them. After all, was that not an occasion for merrymaking? They had taught those rookies, and now at least some of those kids were on their way to becoming Chunin before even spending a year as Jenin. Was that not an extraordinary event worthy of much fanfare and wassailing? So they had poked and prodded Iruka into coming along and having a few drinks. He could remember bad music and worse karaoke, cheap booze and many toasts. To health, they'd raised their glasses several times, to teachers and students, to the Chunin exams, so on and so forth, they had gone, coming up with increasingly contrived excuses to clink their cups and down more shots, to pretty women in slinky dresses. One of the older bachelors among their number had cheered, leering companionably at a fairly tipsy Suzum sensei to cute young men in tight jeans. She cheerily rejoined, winking at her boyish, 19-year-old teaching assistant, to cheap booze. One of the drunker teachers interjected, raising their own glass, to a strong economy and good exchange rate, another chortled, to surplus harvests and, hick, cute farmer's daughters, crowed the first, so it had gone, on and on, degenerating from there further and further into debauchery, excess, and minimum wage hedonism. Iruka could hardly remember anything of the night past the two-hour mark, nothing except a lonely-looking face and a rare, bold feeling of confidence welling up in his chest. Quite frankly, Iruka was just thankful that today wasn't a school day, or he and his colleagues probably would have earned themselves some very serious lectures from the board of supervisors. He especially, considering how late he'd awoken, which brought him back to the matter of what, or rather, who, had woken him. Thus his thoughts came full circle, and he was left no recourse, but to ignore everything and hope it went away. With a soft groan, Iruka removed the pitcher from its niche and poured himself a hot cup of joe. Ugh, how drunk was I, last night, he heard his surprise bedmate mutter. I don't know how she can stand to do this all the time, this piteous moan came from the dining room, reminding Iruka of his lovely and unexpected house guest. His cheeks burned hotly, the young man immediately recalling the very first thing he'd seen upon waking up that afternoon. It had truly been a wonderful view. I wouldn't know, Iruka said, trying to distract himself from thoughts of naked flesh. I can't really remember what happened, well, at all last night, really. It was a very eventful evening, don't think about sex, don't think about sex, don't think about sex, yeah, I'll bet it was, the woman said almost absent-mindedly. She sounded a tad disappointed. HRM. But you don't remember anything then, not even, ah, uh, how we got into bed together, or, ah, uh, what came afterward, ah, uh, and I just thought about sex, damn it. Iruka blushed a vibrant, rather striking shade of scarlet, no, I only wish I did, he blurted out, failing to censor himself in his pre-coffee state, it would still take several minutes for the caffeine to kick in, so there was a moment of awkward silence before he actually registered what he'd just said, ah, uh, eh, uh, you know, so I could, ah, uh, um, he heard a squeak, and a moment later his guest started to stammer, WW well, I don't blame you for wishing you could remember, she nervously babbled, I can't really recall what happened last night, either a pregnant pause passed between them, lasting several seconds, she broke it hesitantly, with a mumbled, so, uh, say, do you suppose, it was any, you know, good, Iruka jumped, this question so startled him that he nearly dropped the sweetener into his coffee, packet and all, what, the sex, he asked unthinkingly, replying before he could measure his statement. 
He heard a thump and a crash from the dining room, sounding almost like someone had jumped, fallen, and tipped the table. Eee, yes, came his guest's voice, the sa, sssss sex, um, well, Iruka flushed deeper and scratched the back of his neck. Ah, do you take milk or cream with your coffee, he asked, not sure what to say in response to a question like that. Could he really be honest and say he had no idea, because it wasn't like he'd ever actually had sex before. Cream, she said, and he heard her grunt, and the sound of something heavy being shifted. Uh, and two sugars, will artificial sweeteners do, he asked, taking an anxious sip from his own coffee. My sugar's buried kind of deep in the cupboard, Sue Shaw, she answered. That sounds, ah, uh, good, he felt himself blush at this word, as though it had suddenly taken on a very dirty meaning from the context of their prior discussion. Would he ever be able to say good again without thinking of her question, and the circumstances which prompted it, or perhaps the phrase would forever become associated in his mind with the flash of her naked body, the reddening of her face, the widening of her eyes as she watched him blink and realized that he was awake and looking right at her. Yes, he said, gulping, good, the word even felt dirty coming in his own mouth, and Iruka felt embarrassed to say it. With one simple inquiry it seemed that this woman had forever tainted one of the most common and innocuous of words, making it sound so lewd and indecent to Iruka. Clumsily, the Chunin shook his head, as though the motion would somehow send all these confusing thoughts tumbling out of his brain, and grabbed another mug, completely plain, eggshell white, and a thing of creamer. Steam rose from the coffee in sinuous tendrils as he poured it, something about the shape of the ascending wisps bringing to mind long and slender legs, smooth and firm with a tempting softness. The contours which climbed all the way from dainty little toes to a lovely pair of. Iruka slapped himself, preempting his thoughts right as they were about to plunge headlong into the gutter. Eh? Are you okay? That accursedly pretty woman called, a hint of slight worry in her voice. Of course she could hear him. Yes, I'm fine, he called back, grabbing a packet of sweetener next. It was nothing really, her voice came, sounding unconvinced. I thought I heard, it was nothing Iruka insisted. I just slipped a little bit, oh, she said. W well, be careful then. Don't hurt yourself on my account, Iruka blushed, feeling almost more flustered by this simple show of concern than by any recollection of bare skin and supple curves, I will I will, he mumbled, tearing open the packet and dumping the non-sugar into the coffee, no need to worry, he swilled the mug's contents with a stirrer, feeling hesitant to head into the dining room, idly, he realized that he didn't even know this woman's name, or at least he didn't remember it, it felt entirely surreal to think this, he had woken up naked next to a woman whose name he didn't even know heaven above, that made him feel absolute awful, just thinking about the mere idea of it left Iruka feeling guilty, as though he had done her an inexcusable disservice, feeling painfully aware of the fire in his cheeks, Iruka reluctantly took the mug out to his guest, he noticed that the table was arranged differently than it had been when he went into the kitchen, and its position appeared to have been slightly altered, here you go he said distractedly, setting the coffee on the table in front of her, be careful, it's um, hot, Despite the mussy state of her hair, the bags under her eyes, and the fact that her clothes were dirty, disheveled, and smelling strongly booze, something about the woman before him left Iruka feeling butterflies in his stomach, it might have had something to do with the fact that he could still vividly remember the sight of her standing above him, stretching in her birthday suit to reach a pair of panties that were dangling from the ceiling fan. The woman smiled appreciatively, lopsidedly, and blew once on the mug's contents before taking a sip. Thanks, she said. I, uh, Appreciate the hospitality Iruka blushed and coughed into his fist. Why you're welcome, he told her, scratching his cheek. It's nice to, ah, uh, have company. She stared intently down at her coffee, and he saw her face flame up at his words. I see, she said awkwardly. That's nice. You have, a nice place. I a paused, the flush in her cheeks spread further, painting her entire face a bright scarlet. Comma, I don't think I know your name, she said, and the look on her face made it clear that this was very embarrassing for her to confess. Sorry, Iruka laughed sheepishly, eh uh, no, that's okay, he told her, you're not the only one, swallow, you don't remember your name, she asked him, blurting it out, and eh, no, I know my name, Iruka said, sweet dripping, I suppose I worded that poorly, my fault, sorry, she looked at the wall to her right, the flush crawling swiftly down her neck, Iruka watched her spreading, deepening blush with a hint of fascination, oh, she said lamely, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense, Aya, Guess I wasn't thinking clearly, don't worry about it, Iruka said, fidgeting nervously. Neither of us is at the top of our game right now, he looked down at his shorts and undershirt, feeling extra conscious of his state of dress. I'm a mess, she groaned miserably. I look awful, don't I of course not, Iruka immediately replied. The force of this statement surprising even himself, he flushed. Ah I mean, 
you just haven't had a chance to wash up, yet, he trailed off, she fidgeted self-consciously, I'm sorry she said, this is so awkward, I've never really been in this kind of situation before, I have no idea what the right thing to do is, you and me both Iruka sighed, geez, I'm sorry if I've, ah, been making you feel uncomfortable and no, I'm fine, she yelped, nearly jumping out of her seat, I'm perfectly fine, it's not uncomfortable or anything, I just, I don't have experience with this sort of thing, me neither, to be honest, Iruka gulped, I have no idea what this means, where do we even go from here, neither one of us remembers a thing about last night, she fiddled with a stray lock of hair, I don't know, she said, where would you want it to go, I mean, I know we were drunk, but this is still the first time I've ever, well, woken up in bed with a man, ah, uh, Iruka said, so you're also, or, you were also, um, he fidgeted, she blushed, you too, she asked, I'm surprised, why yeah, he said, I'll admit I'm a little surprised that you are, too, a pretty girl like you, a silence, oh, she squeaked, you mean, you think I'm, you are, he said, his face a deep shade of red, but I'm sure you hear that all the time, ah, uh, her expression brightened, a small smile gracing her lips, it's Shizun, she told him softly, and I suppose I've been told that before, but, fidget, fidget, comma, being flattered by drunks and perverts just doesn't feel the same, I suppose it helps that you haven't once tried to, ah, uh, grab me since you woke up, he scratched his cheek, I see, that's a nice name, Shizun, it suits you, he smiled, absent mindedly rubbing the scar on the bridge of his nose, you can call me Iruka, oh, is that a code name, she asked, seeming to relax a little bit, if it is, then it got assigned to me awfully early, he answered, but, no, it's just my name, Iruka Yumino, she took another sip of her coffee, do you go by a different name on the job, then, she asked half jokingly, no no he said, waving a hand in the air, smiling sheepishly, sorry to say I'm just a run of the mill academy instructor, nothing especially impressive, Shizun H M'd at this, looking absent mindedly thoughtful, so you're good with kids, then, she found herself murmuring, maybe, maybe, Iruka laughed, slowly loosening up, I suppose so, although I seem to have a knack for attracting the most disruptive troublemakers to my class, haha, <laughs> I guess it's probably penance for all the hell I put my own teachers through, I'm sure you were a sweet kid, Shizun said, I really wasn't he told her, shaking his head in spite of a grin, it makes me cringe to think about all the mischief I used to cause, especially now that I know what it's like from the other end, and just what sort of mischief did you cause back in the day, she asked coyly, Iruka blushed and scratched the back of his neck, oh all kinds he said, I was a real nightmare in those days, but then I suppose we all were, in our own ways, he trailed off with a shrug, well I'm sure you know how it was, after the attack he said, I was just a kid when the Kyubi came, but, well, I'm sure that's not something we need to talk about right now, he waved it off, I suppose you'll want to use the shower, I really need it, she answered, nodding, any preference about when you want to go he asked, I should probably have a quick shower, myself he stomped down the tiny, damnably incorrigible voice, that told him to share, not knowing or guessing that Shizun was repressing a similar impulse at the exact same moment, that was probably for the best. Sasuke sighed lanceferingly as he approached the dango shop, his eyes were glaring holes into the dirt road, his face a mask of suppressed irritation, this is irksome he thought to himself, Naruto and Sakura are both making inroads with their former mentors, while I, he scowled, most assuredly Naruto had to have signed the toad summoning contract by now, and even if he hadn't quite yet, he was sure to do so at the final phase of the Chunin exams, Sakura too, had begun to establish a rapport with Tsunade, and with her luck was bound to be taken under the woman's wing sooner rather than later, this bugged Sasuke a little more than he was happy to admit, mostly because he didn't want to have to hold back the better part of his arsenal in the final phase, when it came time to fight Naruto, and they would fight, so help him, even if Sasuke had to personally move heaven and earth just to make sure no one interfered, while he could always fish a copy of the hawk summoning contract out of his clan's storage, Onsukumaru and his avian kin would not make for an appropriate matchup against one of the Gama clan, it wouldn't feel right, if he and Naruto used summoning jutsu in their match, and they probably would, if they had to refrain from using their favored trump cards of perfect Susanoo and Biju sage mode, considering the restrictions of the far too, small arena they would be duking it out in, Sasuke wanted it to be a reasonably fair fight, which meant he would need the snake summoning contract, it just wouldn't feel proper, otherwise, unfortunately, the route via which Sasuke had originally obtained the snake contract was presently unavailable to him, perhaps for good, if Orochimaru vanishing to the furthest edges of Naruto's maximum sensory range was any indication, so that was kind of a problem, fortunately, his wife had pointed out a possible alternate route to getting his signature on the Ryuji cave contract, unfortunately however, 
the way in which Sakura had suggested for him to convince Anko to train him was, well, undignified, to say the least. Anko-san is also a snake summoner, isn't she? You could probably get her to teach you, if you put your mind to it. And it seems like she's taken a shine to you in this timeline too. You could probably appeal to her vanity by pretending to have a crush on her. And she is a very striking woman, isn't she? I'm sure it shouldn't be too much of a stretch to imagine you having a mild infatuation with her, dear and she'd winked while saying this too. Sometimes, a part of Sasuke longed for the days of the slavishly obsessed fangirl Sakura, who would have never thought to look at another man, or maybe the later, violently possessive girlfriend Sakura, who probably would have brutally murdered him at the slightest hint that he might even jokingly entertain the notion of possibly someday looking at another woman. Then he'd stop, sigh, and admit to himself that, truthfully, he wouldn't trade the playful and the pen-minded wife he had now for the world, even if she did like to tease him more than his pride would have preferred. Turnaround was fair play, he supposed, and it was admittedly fun for him as well, when they were alone. It was kind of ironic how the girl who used to follow him around like a lost little puppy was now probably the only woman alive with the raw force of will and sheer determination to tame the henceforth untamable Sasukacha, or maybe appropriate, possibly funny. Sasuke was not an expert on literary terminology, but either way, Sakura did have a good point. As usual, the archer coughed into his fist as he crossed the threshold of the dango shop, spying his target languorously slouched over a plate heaped high with sweet, skewered dumplings, with a mixture of acting skill and the remembered sensations of the woman slyly pecking him on the cheek while certain, other things pressed into his back, he willed his face to color a slight pink, every aspect of his behavior from that point onward was carefully calculated, each slight tremor of his voice and shift of his glance carried out with precise deliberation. He made a point to glance at her chest as though unable to quite help himself, darkening his cheeks a shade further before jerking his head up. He fidgeted and mumbled and consciously failed to completely look her in the eye, hesitating just long enough to make it seem natural, stumbling over his words in such a way as to emphasize nerves without too greatly diverging from people's perceptions of himself. Like a proud but flustered Sundeer, Sasuke looked away and cut himself off at points, blushing and continuing shakily, conspicuously editing his tone and words accordingly in line with the mood and context. A good ninja had to be a good actor, and he wasn't considered the best for nothing. He introduced himself awkwardly, making a show of anxiety in how he greeted Anko, clearing his throat and making it look like he was trying to uphold his pride even as he confessed something embarrassing. Very few people could see through his acts. Naruto was one, and Sakura another. Hinata could also penetrate his less subtle facades, although the better ones tended to trip her up. It took a close and intimate understanding of his personality to know exactly when he was putting on a show and when he was being genuinely sincere. And that's the way it was with most people, really. Sasuke's talents for the multiplicitous pretensions of everyday civility were simply a little more advanced than most. Ah, excuse me, Anko-san was it? He inquired, flushing and mumbling a bit. Hi, uh, I'm Sasuke, do you um, remember me? Anko looked up from her dango and eyed Sasuke curiously. She smirked a tad at the sight of his apparent Beflis Thurmond. Yes, she said wryly, I'm Anko, and Anko means me, and I don't know about any Sasuke, but I do remember a cute little twerp with some decent skills outside the forest of death though he still managed to get all embarrassed over a tiny bit of physical contact. Hair, she chuckled, eyes dancing with amusement. Sasuke's hand twitched to his cheek, the side of his face, where Anko had planted that playfully chaste and teasing kiss. His blush became a little more genuine, as he noted a hint of the slightest and most general apparent similarities between Anko and Sakura, a scary thought if there ever was one. Ah uh, um, why yes well, he stammered, looking away from Anko and making a point to seem like he was resisting the urge to look more southward of her face, well that was, um, a surprise and it sort of, uh, caught me off guard, I see, Anko said, grinning from ear to ear, so you find yourself feeling confused and intrigued do you, you really are just an innocent little brat. No need to feel ashamed though, kid, it's only natural you'd become infatuated with a babe like myself Sasuke sweet dropped at the immodesty of this statement. You sound awfully sure of yourself, he mentally succumbed, biting back the urge to make a sarcastic retort. I'm not an impressionable little boy who gets a crush on any halfway attractive woman he sees, you know, that's more Naruto than me really. Out loud however, where others could see and hear him, Sasuke simply cleared his throat and tugged at his collar. Do you really think so he asked, cheeks reddening. HMPH. Well, I don't know where you got that impression from, but, it's not like I've got a sea crush on you, or anything he mumbled, fidgeting. Anko chortled and clapped a hand down on Sasuke's shoulder, yanking him into a crushing one-armed hug. Sasuke winced, and not just from the rough nudgy she proceeded to give him, or the relative proximity of his face to her bosom. Now now, Anko said, wagging a finger, 
Don't lie, kid. I can tell just from the look on your face that you've got it bad. Uh, the curse of being beautiful, she sighed theatrically. Sorry to break your heart, though, but while you're a cute little twerp and all, I'm just not into that kind of thing. Sasuk squirmed uncomfortably in Anko's arms, making a conscious effort to restrain himself and not accidentally break out of her grip. Oh, oh, I see, he said, feigning disappointment. That's well, okay, I guess I understand, don't feel bad. Anko cheerfully reassured him. That teammate of yours is pretty cute, herself. You make a nice couple with her, I think. Even if I were interested in you, I wouldn't want to break that up, she chuckled. Probably. Sasuke gulped. Why yeah, he murmured. Sakura is really, um, say no more, Anko laughed. I can tell what it is. You want to impress her, don't you? Now that you know this little crush on me won't be going anywhere, Sasuke said nothing. He could tell that he didn't need to. Well, I usually stay out of matters of the heart, but you're an amusing kid so I suppose I could make an exception, just this once you understand, she clapped him on the back, how does that sound eh, big sis Anko will teach you all about how to make your teammate fall for you, slowly, hesitantly, Sasuk voiced the inquiry, in what way, Anko made a show of thinking, well, I don't know much about romance, honestly, she confessed, never really bothered with all that lovey dovey stuff, but if there's one thing I do know, it's how to kick ass, you're going to train me in that way, Sasuk asked, guessing that it would be best to voice the question, wouldn't that be considered a conflict of interests, do I look like I care about that boring legal crap, Anko retorted, the only reason I even passed out those liability waivers at all was because the other proctors had riding my ass about it, ah, oh, Sasuk murmured, I see, a beat, so I hear you can summon snakes, he mentioned casually, reckoning that there was little point to beating around the bush anymore, meh, it's a thing, I guess, Anko replied, Shrugging, I don't really use it for much more than Sinijashu, though, most of the time, not like I've got any particular sentimental attachment to it, not since I was a kid, another pause, carefully timed, waiting for just the right moment to strike, Sasuke hesitated deliberately, posing his next and final question in a very specific tone and timber, comma, could you teach me, Anko grinned, sure, why the hell not, that ought to put a bee in the old bastard's bonnet, so saying this, she released her hold on Sasuke and let out a borderline maniacal laugh, and on a certain beach in the Crescent Moon Kingdom, Orochimaru sneezed yet again, tent and huffed irritably, scowling as she walked to the training ground. She was not in the best of moods, and a part of her would have preferred to stay home and take the day off. It was irksome to go down there every day and see Lee and Neji, especially since she wasn't too happy with either of her teammates at present, but she couldn't just skip out on her exercises. Guy sensei might have primarily been focusing on improving Lee's combat skills for the third test, but that didn't mean Tenten or Neji could, or would, skip out on their own training, even if Lee was the only member of their team to have made it to the third and final phase of the Chunin exams, they still had their own pride as ninja, and on the bright side, Tenten told herself, at least that four-eyed floozy was too busy with her personal training to come down, otherwise she probably would have killed someone by now, stupid redhead, the brunette muttered, thinking of the bespectacled Uzumaki, who does she think she is, barging in on our team dynamic like that, she spun a kunai between her fingers, flicking it out of its holster and tossing it idly from one hand to the other, her cheeks were the faintest shade of red beneath the morning sun, and gravel produced a muffled crunching sound under her sandals, Haya, Suo, Haya, Deraya, Oria, Watcher, in the near distance, the sounds of grunted Kiai and thumping fists, could be heard, Li and Guy's voices carried a good distance in the heat of training, two hot-blooded men pushing themselves to their uttermost limits, and their exercise regimen had become more insane than ever before, because apparently Lee was only now at a level where Guy could train him seriously, Tenton, really wasn't sure what to think about that, if she hadn't been training alongside them for the past three weeks, she probably wouldn't have thought it possible for those two to train even harder, but she had seen the proof with her own two eyes, even with as harsh as Lee's training had been before the Chuanin exams, nothing could compare to the grueling hell he now underwent every day, she was equal parts amazed and disturbed by the sheer intensity of their training, it made all of their past exercises look like mere kitty stuff, the clearing where team Guy practiced came into sight, Lee was sparring with Guy sensei, going through his taijutsu forms, building his physical power and endurance to even greater heights, it was a little or inspiring to watch, and Tenton felt her face burn from something wholly unrelated to the sun's rays as sweat glistened on ruddy flesh and muscles flexed under skin tight spandex, quietly coughing into her fist, the weapons mistress sheepishly turned her gaze elsewhere, she observed Neji at another end of the clearing, the prodigy pushing himself to the limit with some rather harsh strength building exercises of his own, Tenton watched him for a moment admittedly impressed by his grit, after his frankly humiliating defeat at Lee's hands, 
Neji had redoubled his training thrice over, for all the genius's fatalism and talk of predestined outcomes, he seemed stubbornly determined not to lose to Lee a second time, even if she was still a tad sore over Neji's insensitive behavior during the preliminaries, Tenton could at least respect that kind of resolve, he was working hard to improve his skills and cross the gap that had emerged between himself and Lee, a curious reversal of their former positions, Tenton smiled a bit in spite of herself, absent mindedly she flicked a cunei 30 meters into the bullseye of a training target, perfect accuracy, she may have been very ordinary and unremarkable by most standards of measurement, but there was one thing she did better than anyone else, nobody threw knives like Tenton, in another, grittier setting, that marksmanship and proficiency with assorted weapons might have made her a force to be reckoned with, a veritable combined harvester of death, dealing pointy metal, in a world of giant monsters and superhuman freaks like this however, her talents were very ordinary and pretty much just a novelty, but weapons handling was her specialty, and she did it better than any other genin. By the time she was finished, the practice targets would be fair riddled with iron. Thunk, thunk, thunk. Kune impacted dead center on every target. Front, up, left, down, right, back, over the shoulder, under the elbow, around the waist. She threw darts in every direction, steadily and incrementally honing her ability to aim from peripheral vision and identify targets at first glance. It was a steep learning curve, but Tenton didn't miss a single mark, this was her element, um, excuse me, a voice caught Tenton off guard, distracting her from her target practice, she stumbled, surprised, and spun around to face the speaker, recognition was immediate, Karin, Tenton said, seeing the bespectacled Kusa Kunoichi, she narrowed her eyes, what are you doing here, HMPH, if you need some advice about what to do about your hair, Karin scowled and pushed her glasses up the bridge of her nose, she took this greeting with all the grace she could muster, dauntlessly ignoring this attempt of provocation. Dark eyes flicked over to where Lee was sparring with Gai Sensei, and her expression softened. The Teijutsu specialist was absorbed in his exercise, and he didn't seem to notice Karen's presence in the training ground yet. The redhead blushed. I'm here for Lee Kun, she mumbled. He's pretty busy, as I'm sure you can see. Tenton responded, pursing her lips. I don't think he'd appreciate being interrupted, even if it's, you know, you. Karen fidgeted. Ah. Are you sure? He usually seems to enjoy my company, maybe he does, usually, but Lee takes his training very seriously, so I've seen, Karen mused, smiling, but I think he'll make an exception for this, mm, for what Tenton asked, frowning curiously, a family reunion Karen said, I asked him about it last week, and he said yes, you know, to going as my date, that is, a cunei handle bent in Tenton's crushing grip, a date she said, her mouth curled into a grimace that might have been a half-hotted go at politely smiling. I see, you want to take that Lee on a date, HMPH. Good luck with that girl, I don't think he even owns any formal wear, I've already rented something in his size. Karen replied, her smile equal parts knowing and smug, he wanted us to wear matching outfits see, and suggested tea hat I take care of the details, I think he'll clean up very nicely, Tenton crossed her arms over her chest. Her lips twitched as though they wanted to become a pout or a scowl but were prevented by their owner's pride from following the expression through. I see. Well then, don't let me get in your way. Go ahead and fetch Lee for your little date, she said this slowly, her tone carefully neutral. The aggression in her eyes was communicated only passively. A snide remark here disguised as something innocuous, or an understated smirk thereafter looking for a few seconds at some aspect of the other girl's dress or appearance. It was a curious aspect of the female social ritual. This faint politeness covering bared fangs with airs art smiles, a subtler, more affectless approach than a hot-blooded guy likely would understand or appreciate. Tenton wasn't a master of such hollow niceties by any means, but she could still do at least this much. Karen retaliated in kind. I will, the redhead said sweetly, her tone dripping with iced honey like a hornet's venom. And that was a rather weird mixed metaphor that didn't really make much sense when you thought about it, but it sounded kind of cool. Thank you Tenton Red Heart. She once more adjusted her glasses, lenses flared in the morning light, becoming opaque discs of white, and her lips melted briefly into an unmistakable smirk, then the saccharine smile returned, and she flounced gaily, girlishly off towards Lee, Tenton glared at the back of the other girl's head for a moment, and I twitched with irritation, spinning on her heels, the brunette stomped over to her other teammate, Neji she snapped, interrupting the high Ruga's exercises, she grabbed him roughly by the collar, the expression on her face rather deathly frightening, Look alive, pal, you're coming with me, eh? Wah, Neji gulped, caught squarely off balance by this sudden, firm declaration. A dusting of the lightest pink colored his face. Tenton, ha, eh? Where are we going? From the opposite end of the clearing there came a cry of Karen Chan, 
and from the corner of her eyes Tenton espied their green-clad comrade practically tripping over his own feet to greet the bespectacled lass, the brunette's eyes narrowed infinitesimally, watching as Lee threw his arms over the redhead's shoulder and pulled her into a warm-looking bear hug, Tenton's grip on Niji's collar tightened, to crash a party she said with all the grim determination of one declaring a full-out war, Neji blinked, wait what, in a fairly nice part of Kanoha, a certain rec center had been booked by a certain group for a very specific pair of events, two family reunions for two practically extinct shinobi clans, Uzumaki and Uchiha, they were being held in the same location, at the same time, for all intents and purposes, it was a single thing, and it was something of a minor to do, as well, garnering a fair bit of gossip from curious citizens, there was much speculating when people first heard of it, and village customs had a hell of a time vetting all the foreign guests, some folk griped about the timing of this event, and others muttered about Naruto, plus a few stubborn old-timers who grumbled suspiciously about Sasuke and alleged clan elitism, but regardless, the day of the party came, without trouble or incident, the date planned for roughly a week before stage 3 of the Chunin exams, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the invitations had said it would be starting, outside, the weather was lightly overcast, sunlight came down only intermittently through the thin cloud cover, pleasantly cool, if a tad bit dreary for some, Sasuke and Naruto stood inside the door, the hosts of the two functions, dressed in formal men's kimono bearing the heraldic brands of their respective clans, smiling politely, one wider and more cheerful than the other, they greeted their guests with everything from bows to waves to handshakes, yo, Hanoka, how's it hanging, I hear you've been working with experimental summoning jutsu R. Kid-san, I'm glad to see that you were able to make the journey, despite the distance, Karen, haha, <laughs> so good to see you, and bushy brows too, man, I would not have expected you two to hook up, mm. So Danzo won't be coming after all, I wasn't sure, despite the RSVP, well, it's a shame either way, but I do understand that he is a very busy man, next to the hosts were their dates, Hinata and Sakura, dressed in Yukata, they also helped greet the guests, smiling and making small talk as they led them inside, the two young girls made a very positive impression with their sweet and friendly demeanors, Keru is it, it's a pleasure to meet you I must say, ah, and these must be your teammates, I'm Honored Red Heart, Greetings, Himuro, hee hee, and I bet this is your wife, Sitsuna, how's the weather in Kanoha treating you too? This is a pleasant surprise, Natsuhi-san, we weren't sure if you'd be able to make it. A shame to hear that your son couldn't come, Taro Yamada, huh? I don't recall that being one of the names on the guest list. I do see something of a family resemblance though, especially around the cheekbones. The Uzumaki attendees were numerous, an eclectic mix of people from all over. Several redheads from many lands had gathered once more under the banner of the former Yuzushiaga Kyo's most famed shinobi clan, getting together mostly for the free food, and partly out of curiosity about the host. Rock Lee was there with Karin, he being the sensor's date, a genin squad from Cloud accompanied their red-headed friend Keru, with their sensei escorting them, dubiously, incognito. A freelancer by the name of Anoka chatted amicably with a star village Kunoichi, who was officially dead, a bouquet of origami flowers lay by the guest registry, an attached letter giving the formal regrets of its senders at being unable to attend, while a dark figure with blue hair sculpted about on the edges of the group, Kakashi Hatake was present on the Uchiha side, invited on the grounds that he possessed the Shiringan, and was apparently thus an honorary clan member, similarly had Danzo Shimura been invited, though the man had bluntly declined and RSVP'd only to say that he was a very important, very busy man with no time for the puerile jests of young boys, most of the other Uchiha attendees were civilians, merely very distant relatives whom Sasuke had tracked down over several days of tirelessly perusing birth records and genealogy charts, people mostly descended from lines that had split off from the Uchiha decades ago, possessing neither Shiringan nor aptitude for Ninyutsu, the majority of them were older citizens of the Land of Fire, and the few younger ones who were present were primarily female, and among these civilians was one individual of otherwise nondescript appearance, who happened to bear a passing resemblance to one Itachi Uchiha, which, to be fair, was mostly because he had dyed his raven locks brown and popped in blue contacts so as to covertly enter the village as part of a minor noble's protection detail, half on the job for Akatsuki, and half as an excuse to check up on his little brother. Sunate cast a critical eye at her surroundings, appraising the various people attending the reunion. It was a real motley assortment on the Uzumaki side, a motley mix of freaks and weirdos gathered together for a single purpose. Compared to that pack of eccentrics, the Uchiha seemed downright normal probably because they were really just very distant relatives with almost no actual connection to the old clan. She took a sip of sadly unspiked punch and hummed. It's a lot less stuffy than I would have expected from an Uchiha clan function, the blonde mused to herself. Jiraiya sipped from his own cup and grinned at Tsunade. 
His eyes dipped down to her cleavage a little longer than she liked, rather irking her with his roving gaze. Well, it's an Uzumaki soiree too, and we both know how they used to party the toad summoner roguishly replied. Tsunade glowered at her old teammate. His presence at this reunion was an unexpected turn of events, annoying on many levels, and dreadfully inconvenient in a few different ways, especially since he was standing by the punch bowl and hitting on every halfway attractive, possibly single woman to come his way. Those womanizing old habits of his peeved Tsunade something fierce, and not just because of how big a pervert he was, mm yes, I still can't believe those kids would have the balls to do something like this, though she muttered, why, Jiraiya wondered, because most of the Uzumaki had been scattered or in hiding, or because all the Uchiha here are just distantly related civilians, Tsunade shrugged, a little of both I suppose, but there's also the fact that some people rather high up in the village might have reason to take umbrage at this, she mused. You know, since they're holding this reunion a week before the tune-in exams, security is probably throwing a fit over so many unauthorized foreigners waltzing into the village right when they're at their busiest with prep work for the final test. Haha, <laughs> yeah, probably, I reckon it's all in good fun though Jiraiya said with a laugh. Those kids don't seem too hung up over what other folk think of them. They're the sorts to just do what they believe is right with no regard for protocol or decorum, I bet, they're idiots, Sunade grumbled, and that's a pretty big problem in its own way although it really isn't any of my concern. Sakura's probably the only intelligent one of the lot, and even she seems pretty out there half the time, maybe, Jiraiya shrugged, but I like em, they've got chutzpa, guts his hand moved, glomp, Tsune twitched, her cheeks reddening, Jiraiya, she said lowly, take your hand off my ass before I remove it for you, permanently, uh, right, a uh, hair of course, he sheepishly let go, so you work with, summoning jutsu, was it, Natsuhi for Shigakure, legally dead and living in self-exile from her village, smiled nervously as she attempted to make some small talk with one of her apparent relatives. Oh yes, it's a very interesting field, Hanoko Uzumaki replied, smiled cheerfully. Although I'm mostly just on staff to restrain the more dangerous specimens, I still see all kinds of fantastic things, Natashi blinked. Wait, specimens, she said. Aha, of course, Hanoko nodded. It's kind of top secret, but they've been working on developing new summoned beasts using bioengineering and genetic manipulation. Really, it's the most fascinating work I've seen in years. We've even cloned a number of extinct creatures for use in the experiments. Do you know, they actually devised a sort of medical jutsu to reverse nuclear entropy just so they'd be able to work with dinosaur DNA. It's incredible what you can do with a mix of science and ninjutsu. Almost terrifying, she beamed. Natsuhi found herself at a loss for words, unsure what to say in the face of the other woman's excited technical jargon. Weakly, she curled her lips into a half acid smile and nodded, the old reliable standby of anyone trapped in an awkward situation. I see, she said. That sounds interesting. That was a lie, of course. In reality, she thought it sounded mindnumbingly boring. Natsuhi was a soldier, after all, and not a scientist, but Hanoka seemed to take Natsuhi's perfunctory reply as an invitation to go on further, and she began talking about chemicals and proteins with longer names than most secret jutsu carrying on with anecdotes about the repetitive minutiae of laboratory work, and spouting off useless little factoids on all kinds of things wholly irrelevant to the majority of ninja. She waxed philosophical on amino acid chains, gushed like a giddy schoolgirl about the interruption of cellular mitosis and grafting of foreign tissues into vital systems, chattering and chirruping over the hybridization and chimerization of various disparate life forms. Natsuhi quickly regretted trying to start a conversation with her. Someone, please help. She though disconsolately as Hanoka yammered on with impenetrably incomprehensible technobable. Please, someone, anyone, save me from this. Ah, Hanoka-san, did you say you work with teratogens? That must be inconvenient, you know, if you felt like starting a family. Natsuhi blinked, the sound of this new voice seeming like a chorus of angels to her ears. She turned to face her savior, and saw a pink-haired girl who couldn't have been more than 12 or 13 years old. Oh yes, Hanoka said, turning as well to face the newcomer. It's practically a necessity, considering our field, you know, creating brand new life forms and all that. But I do love the work I'm doing there, even if it's just restraining the more dangerous specimens. The lab where I work probably has one of the most extensive stores of the most virulent poisons in all the world. Hilotoxins, colchicinoids, beta alkaloids, the works, the pinkette giggled. Lucky you, she chirped, I wish I could have access to half that stuff. The most advanced medical work is as much about harming as healing, you know. But the poisons I get to work with are downright crude compared to that, Natsuhi's sweet dropped. These two were really hitting it off, how about that? But wasn't this girl the Uchiha boy's girlfriend? Funny how these sorts of things worked out. Neither of them seemed to be paying her any heed, thankfully. 
They were completely absorbed in their discussion, comparing their respective fields of expertise and talking about their work experiences. Apparently the girl was already a very accomplished medic nin, despite her youth. Sighing in relief, Natsuhi took the opportunity, which presented itself and slipped away before she could get dragged back into the conversation. Keru stared balefully at her alleged date, the chubby and mild-mannered lad cheerfully chowing down handfuls of lightly salted potato chips, her left eye twitched, how the hell did I get roped into this, this was merely rhetorical of course, not even posed as a question, she already knew how it had happened, her teammates were assholes, that's how, that, and B sensei had a twisted sense of humor, first they pestered her into RSVPing to that invitation and saying that of course she would attend this bloody stupid reunion for a family her kinship to which she tried to downplay as much as possible, on Samui and Omoi's parts, this had probably been done out of the assumption that connecting with her distant relatives might somehow be good for Keru, or something. Sensei on the other hand, had obviously just used this reunion as an excuse to get out of the village for a while, and Keru was still pretty sure that, while she and Samui and Omoi might have somehow gotten permission to leave for this event, there was no damned way on God's green earth that the Lord Rakage would have ever given his brother leave to come along to Kanoha, tune in exams or no. So they probably had a lecture from a furious Asama to look forward to when they got home too. Fantastic. But worse still, her teammates had then taken a look at the plus one on the invitation and promptly insisted that Keru would need a date. She had fought this for months, from the day she got the letter to the day they arrived in Kanoha, but Omoi and Samui had refused to relent. Probably they saw it as a good laugh. Keru had just found it obnoxious. By the time they arrived for the reunion, She'd grown utterly sick of their casual remarks and subtle suggestions, to the point where she felt ready to flip her lid and throttle her teammates, it finally got to the point where she'd just lost all patience, snapped, and decided to simply invite the first guy her age she ran into, anything to silence those prats. So, naturally, she'd crashed into Tubby over there, Chaoji Akimichi, as he'd introduced himself approximately three seconds after making that decision known to her teammates, just her luck really, Samui had smirked at Keru, and Omoi had visibly struggled to stifle his sniggers, the sensei simply gave her a thumbs up, like he was telling her to go for it, even though Keru very much did not want to, if asked, after the fact, why she had followed through on her declaration and asked the boy out, she would insist vehemently that she had done so only under the most extreme of duress, she would fidget slightly and avert her gaze while saying this however, now, in all fairness the boy did seem nice enough, he'd been pleasantly surprised by her invitation, and had in fact gone to some trouble to make himself presentable, although his lamely slicked hair and stiflingly formal clothes gave off the impression that his mother had played a sizable part in dressing him up, so that detracted a few points, and Chaoji was hardly the suavest fellow Keru could have imagined, he looked about as awkward in those clothes as she felt on this date though, so they could at least bond over their shared discomfort, and on the plus side, he did know all the best local delicacies, Keru took a bite out of a fresh spring bun, soft and warm with a hint of sweetness that she couldn't quite place, yes, if nothing else, Chaoji could identify the best snacks and refreshments on site, his taste in potato chips left something to be desired, Keru was a consomme girl all the way, but he otherwise seemed to have a good sense for food, and it's not like he was really painful to look at, either, or a complete bore to talk with, he was a very good listener, but straightforward with his opinions, which was something Keru could appreciate, these hors d'oeuvres are pretty good, I've got to say, mused Anko Miterashi, snatching another tiny sandwich off a waiter's tray, fancier than my usual fare, but not too rich, I think I could eat these things all day, she popped the finger sandwich into her mouth, pausing only to remove the olive-bearing toothpick, Kakashi watched in morbid fascination as Anko messily devoured the appetizer, she was grinning from ear to ear, seeming unbothered by the conflicted expression on Kakashi's face as the man waffled over whether the sight of crumbs, falling into Anko's cleavage ruined his appetite, or aroused him, it his appetite, whether it aroused his appetite, yes, after all it's not like he got, you know, especially, uh, excited from staring at Anko's cleavage, nor was he, ahem, using the crumbs, falling down the front of her dress as an excuse to look at her tits for an extended length of time, nay, he may have read porn in public, even around minors, but Kakashi was a gentleman, goddammit, a real classy sumbitch, he didn't need an excuse to stare at a nice pair of melons, yes, they're very good, he agreed with an absent-minded nod, very sumptuous and perky, a pause, a uh, jerky, they taste like jerky, yeah, you know, the good stuff, real juicy and, ahem, Kakashi coughed, right, Anko laughed, there's some real nice meat between these buns, although the sauce is a bit saltier than I'm used to, very thick too, I imagine it's an acquired taste, said Kakashi offhandedly, Iruka and Shizun seem to be enjoying it quite well, geez, 
you can even see some of it on her cheek, too, Anko observed, doesn't that girl have any shame, Kakashi side-eyed Anko, like you're one to talk he thought, out loud though he said, love does funny things to people I guess, and look, Iruka's wiped it off for her, well good for him, Anko snorted, it's still his fault that stuff got all over her in the first place, Kakashi shrugged, his eye chanced to peer a bit downward in Anko's direction, and he saw a bit of the sticky white condiment in her cleavage, ah, you've got some sauce on you as well, he pointed to her chest, right there between your, Anko smirked, mm, do I now, she looked down, well, so I do, mind being a pal and getting that for me, I don't have a napkin, Kakashi said, lick it up then, Anko said, shrugging, I don't mind, Kakashi sweet dropped, comma, this is just a ploy to see under my mask, isn't it, he sighed, maybe, Anko winked, or maybe I just want you to, loud music promptly boomed through speakers, drowning her out and making it impossible to tell what she said exactly, although her meaning could still probably be inferred from the context alone, Toku de Kikoru Kohinto Ni, Hitori Mata Hitori Tachiyaguru Daoshi, Kakashi winced, and stuffed a finger into one of his ears, sounds like Naruto has found the karaoke machine, he mused, rueful, what, Anko asked, you'd gladly do what to my, Kurakisu Dake no feud and Dora Katsugisu, Junbi eyes are you ready, Naruto belted out the lines as they appeared on the prompter, standing up on stage with Killer B, Rock Lee, and an utterly bemused Neji, he pumped a fist into the air and sang enthusiastically into the mic, grinning from ear to ear as he indulged in what was practically Japan's national pastime, not that he actually knew what a Japan was, Keridaju Furu Asushin do Nihijeshiku Achinaresyo Stomping, Tizu Tsuki Yugokusu Call M, E Kwerazu Yuru Ga Natsukamu Story, the and Lee eagerly joined Naruto for the next bit, and Neji awkwardly stumbled along through the lyrics after them, with no rational cognizance as to why on earth he was doing this, Maybe Tenton's expectant gaze had something to do with it, that, or Hinata-sama's chillingly warm smile. Come on, everybody stand up. Ajero Kyou Ichiban, no Jikan Da, Menimo Tamerinu Speed Hunter, Dirimo Ga Mina Turiko Kanban, yeah, come on, Karen was squeeing and gushing at the foot of the makeshift stage, clapping her hands and cheering as fervently for Lee as a fangirl for her rock star idol. Hinata was more reserved, simply smiling and nodding her head in time with the beat. Tenton was looking a little pink-cheeked as she watched Neji, her lips pursed and arms crossed over her chest, Samui and Omoi were simply weeping tears of gratitude that this song was not one their sensei had written, everybody hands up, Matashita NA heroes come back, Zujao Kazo Yubi Oru countdown, IQ's 3 2 1, make some noise, Iruka took a sip from his punch and sighed, shaking his head in something somewhere between exasperation and amusement. Shizun stood next to him, smiling and giggling at the spectacle the kids and that one cloud ninja were making of themselves on stage, they look like they're having a lot of fun, she commented, yeah, they do don't they, Iruka sighed, clasping his date's hand, I just wish he wouldn't make such a spectacle of it, that Naruto I wouldn't call this a spectacle, Shizun replied, no one is even drunk yet, the party isn't being catered with alcohol, you know he said, since the organizers are minors, trust me, Shizun wearily sighed, Tsunade Sama will find a way, Iruka looked at his date thoughtfully, the two of them dressed in simple formal clothes, you have it rough, don't you he mused, I really do what you gonna do, what you gonna do, Timanaku Nari Hibiki Kizumu, Deja Vu Yori M O G O T S U I Shaojiki Gazanshin W O Hashiri Hanazan, Break IT Down, Killer B sang solo, his deep voice rumbling as he moved in time to the beat, his pupils watched, still relieved that B was not singing lyrics of his own invention. How do you suppose Keru's doing with her date? Samui mused. She's going to kill us when this is over, Omoi muttered. You know that right, oh? Cool your jets, Omoi. She won't kill us, Samui said. I think she'll really enjoy her date, ah, so she'll only cripple and maim us, then, Omoi replied. You're delusional, Samui rolled her eyes. And you don't know the first thing about a woman's heart, she rejoined. Omoi shrugged. Turn it up, turn it up, hey Kikoka, Sekenda Kinao made no koto ga. Koru Darama Damanu Asui, Koburit Afyuta Omoi no Bun Maid, wow, this is some shindig, said unimportant, distant Uchiha relative number one, I know right, said unimportant, distant Uchiha relative number two, have you seen that blonde by the punch bowl, I think she's taken, and twenty years younger than you, from the look of it, well, sure, if you want to rain on my parade, yeah, sure, besides, though, aren't you already married, yeah, with three kids, but that doesn't mean I can't appreciate a nice view, you know, ugh, machinimata showtime se techeru shukumodochira, and I katamuku shauhei no yukuagurukateraya kyou nimotsuburu nagasita kaita sonor denug, neji sang, 
looking flustered and self-conscious with the mic in hand. He did quite well of it, showcasing an impressive singing voice despite obvious nerves and uncertainty as to what the hell he was doing on stage in the first place. Tenton watched and listened, a tiniest guilty smile quirking her lips. Sakura chuckled, looking up from where she was talking shop with Anoka to survey the singing youths. Ha, did Hinata invite Neji at the last minute? I don't remember seeing him on the guest list, Hanoka cocked her head. I have no idea, she said. I'm only a guest, myself are, whatever. Sakura laughed. Doesn't really matter, does it? As long as nobody's causing any trouble, Yehanoka said obligatorily. And honestly, I'm not sure I should even be such an expert on the stuff we're talking about, since I was only hired to restrain the more dangerous summons. So so, with a naturally unreadable expression, Itachi stared at his little brother. Or rather, the illusionary representation of his little brother. To think Sasuke had already managed to trap him in Itsuku Ayomi. They grow up so fast, don't they? Yeah. Just to put it out there right now, I have no intentions of killing you, Itachi blinked. Well, how about that? This was not what he would have expected to hear. Maybe a furious, incoherent shout, yeah. An icy whisper declaring undying hatred, sure. Even questions about why he had done what he'd done. Why not? Asking why Itachi had killed off the rest of their clan, you know. But this, this was just perplexing. Itachi narrowed his eyes and frowned. He eyed Sasuke disapprovingly. Have you already forgotten, little brother, what I did to our clan? HMP aged. It would seem you are even more foolish than I had first thought. Sasuke waved a hand dismissively. This gesture drew Itachi's attention to the fact that this was the only hand Sasuke had on his person. Mildly troubling, though he had already known of this from certain sources within the village, supposedly, the lower half of the boy's left arm had been lost in a mysterious training accident around the same time he graduated from the academy. Considering that Sasuke was also quite clearly in possession of the main Jekaiya Sharingan, a fact which pained Itachi most heavily since he was the one who had told his brother how to acquire those eyes, and basically stated flat out that the main Jekaiya was the only way Sasuke would ever stand a chance against him. He hadn't ever thought Sasuke would achieve it so soon. Well, considering this, Itachi figured that the training accident must have been something like an Amaterasu that got out of Sasuke's control. That seemed like the most logical explanation, all things considered. But then Itachi's thoughts turned, once more, back to Sasuke's earlier statement. He frowned. HN, perhaps I should refresh your memory, Sasuke could not afford to grow complacent. Not with the likes of Danzo and Madara still out there. Itachi's eyes flashed crimson. Hurricane spoke to main Jekaiya coming to life. Their surroundings changed all at once, transforming from a community rec center into the Uchiha clan compound, littered with the corpses of their deceased relatives. Sasuke snorted. Almost as soon as it came into being, this image wavered. The surroundings Itachi conjured through his own Tsukuayomi vanished, replaced by a more natural setting. They stood on a cliff overlooking Naka River. Itachi's heart leaped into his throat. He beheld his late kinsman, Shisu, one eye closed and leaking blood from beneath its lids, standing perilously close to the edge and smiling wanly at a younger version of himself. Upon the brink he stood, weary but hopeful. There is no way to stop the Uchiha's coup deated anymore, these words were ones Itachi remembered all too well. Comma, civil war will erupt in Konoha, and other nations will seize on the advantage provided by our village's disunity, it will become a world war, it was morbidly fascinating. The scene was different from how Itachi remembered it, subtly so in a number of small details, mistakes, which betrayed that this image did not come from his own mind, or the mind of one who had witnessed the actual event, but the fundamental import, nature, and meaning of what he saw could not be mistaken. When I tried to head the coup off with Kotomatsukumi, Danzo stole my right eye. He doesn't trust me, but I've chosen to protect the village in my own way. He'll probably try to take my left eye as well, soon enough. So I'll entrust it to you before that happens. Shisu raised a hand to his remaining eye. Itachi was frozen, unable to do anything but watch in disbelief. The slight differences in small details from his own recollection betrayed that this was not a vision plucked from his head by Sasuke's Jinjutsu, but, then, you're my best friend, and the only one I can count on. Please, Itachi, protect the village, and the Uchiha name, how? Itachi choked out, reeling. Sasuke, what? His whipped his head around to stare at his younger brother, that omnipresent facade of cool and collected composure shattering completely. His mouth was agape, his eyes wide in disbelief and confusion. A hundred different conflicting emotions tore through him. A whirlwind of dismay and confusion. I haven't forgotten anything, Itachi, Sasuke whispered. His voice sounding deeper than normal for a boy his age, even by Uchiha standards. No, if anything I'd say I remember more than I ever did as a child. I could never forget what you did, not even after thirty years. Sasuke inclined his head, all at once, the boy changed before Itachi's eyes. 
He seemed to age by decades in a heartbeat, instantly maturing into the fullness of manhood. Itachi stared at a face morbidly reminiscent of their accursed ancestor, Madara, lips quirked into a bitter smile. The man looked Itachi straight in the eye. Comma, the sacrifice you made for the village, for me? Itachi's blood froze in his veins. You, who are you? He gasped. A chuckle, mirthless and weary. Oh, a great many things the man mused. An absentee father, a distant husband, a lousy friend and disrespectful subordinate, the second strongest ninja alive, Shinobi no Yami, and a hopelessly foolish little brother, who trampled all over his elder sibling's wishes. The setting changed again, becoming a small sitting room adorned in the traditional style. The man knelt down, seating himself before a low table. Comma, I'm Sasuke Uchiha, age 37, and it's been close to 20 years since I last saw my big brother alive, since the day I killed him and learned the truth. A pause, his expression turned sheepish, comma, and kinda went full on nuke nin for a while, what with joining Akatsuki, killing Danzo, swearing to destroy the village, culminating in taking the Biju hostage, declaring my intentions to assassinate the five cage, and attempting to launch a continent-wide revolution that would have destroyed the modern hidden village system and placed myself as the immortal, unquestioned ruler of the world who would have reigned over humanity with an iron fist so as to ensure world peace, or a serviceable facsimile thereof, forever and in perpetuity, Itachi gaped. Sasuke let out a laugh, a hearty chortle unlike anything his brother would have thought him capable of producing. Comma, fortunately, he added, I had a good friend willing and able to knock some sense into that empty head of mine, even if it meant each of us losing an arm and nearly dying in the process, not to mention an infinitely patient woman capable of suffering through my angst long enough to actually make me see the beauty in this world, his smile grew more wistful, almost dreamlike, a beat, numbly, Itachi picked his jaw up off the table, comma, this is a joke, right, Sasuke once more waved his hand dismissively, do you know of anyone alive, in this time, who could actually control a Tsukuyomi better than you, well, ahem, Itachi coughed into a fist, comma, there is Madara, TCH, Sasuke rolled his eyes, that Madeo died a decade before the Uchiha massacre, at least, the guy calling himself Madara right now, is just his successor, a misguided relative by the name of Abito Uchiha, he has a different kind of Shiringan from you, me, or Madara, and only half the pair he was born with, besides, I'm not even sure he can use an ordinary Tsukuyomi, Itachi blinked, calling one of the most famed and sacred of Uchiha Jinjutsu ordinary in any context seemed unutterably bizarre to him, only Aizanami and Kotomatsukami, to his knowledge, could be considered more extraordinary illusions, and one cost its user the sight in one eye, while the other could only be used once a decade unless supercharged with the Lord First's cells, and even then it would still be limited to only once a day. He frowned. I don't know, the acclaimed prodigy murmured, clearly skeptical. Sasuke rolled his eyes. The Walter to Chi's left promptly transformed into an animated, 3D pinup, a slim, fairly attractive woman who looked to be in her mid-thirties, judging by a lightest smattering of wrinkles, frown lines and crow's feet, as well as a few stretch marks, here and there, which seemed to intimate a possible past pregnancy, smiled and posed suggestively, winking at Sasuke and silently giggling. Her hair was short and pink, distinctive, with a distantly familiar turquoise diamond mark on her forehead, like Tsunade, in a way, although this woman's bust was a good few sizes smaller. Also, she was dressed in aught, but a cheek-scorchingly skimpy suspender bikini that left far less to the imagination than poor Itachi was anywhere near comfortable with. It didn't help, either, that she appeared to be maybe twice Itachi's age, even aside from the fact that she bore an undeniably powerful resemblance to the lass who had introduced herself to Taro Yamada as Sasuke's girlfriend. So, seeing this woman in such scant array and suggestive posture felt awkward for Itachi on many levels, a multifaceted world of a godwit of Endo and Dontla Cathartits. Itachi nervously cleared his throat. Peering askance at Sasuke, he saw a look on the man's face reminiscent of an expression he'd seen on their father, once, in happier days when the man had come home a little tipsy and in a very good mood after finally wrapping up a particularly troublesome case, half-repressed memories of their Fugaku Achiha leaning in close over his wife Mikoto's shoulder and whispering things into her ear that made their eldest son wish he'd never learned how to read lips, fingers pinching places their boys had been taught to never touch on a girl, making the woman smile and arch her back with a not at all displeased look on her face, burst into Itachi's mind. He shuddered, feeling both disturbed and uncomfortable, like he was a stranger intruding on something private. It also didn't help that Sasuke and this woman depicted in the image seemed to be only negligibly younger than Fugaku and Mikoto had been when Itachi killed them. This was supposed to be his baby brother right? Itachi coughed. Oh, okay, he mumbled, feeling his cheeks burn something fierce. Suppose I believe what you are saying, Sasuke, and suppose I believe you really are a grown man, in a child's body. 
my foolish, Atauto 25 years older, mentally, than he ought to be. Suppose I trust that what you're saying is even possible. Assuming all of this, I just want to know, how, Sasuke shrugged. Time travel t time travel Itachi parroted. Time travel Sasuke repeated. Presumably, presumably, said Itachi. Again, Sasuke shrugged. Presumably, yes, although I cannot personally say for sure. All I know is that one night I went to sleep an adult, and the next morning I woke up a child. Well, Itachi said, I don't see what else it could be, when you put it like that. You'd be surprised, Sasuke told him. With all the things I've seen over the years, I've learned to keep my mind open to all the possibilities. I see, Itachi lied. I'm sure you don't, Sasuke blithely contested. But that's okay, it really isn't something you can understand unless you've seen this shit for yourself, uh. Okay, Itachi said. He changed the subject. So, you say I made a sacrifice for the village, for you, how so? Sasuke leveled a flat look at his kinda sorta technically older brother. The guy was born first, at least. Our clan was planning a coup, he said bluntly. I'm not entirely clear on the specifics, but essentially it was something like dissatisfaction over a perceived seclusion and marginalization within the village. Long story short, some very influential people in the family decided to try and take over Konoha, and Danzo, that troublesome old goat, believed that wiping out the whole clan was the only answer, which seriously bit everyone so hard in the ass, come the fourth great ninja war, Itachi blinked, wait, excuse me, the fourth what, it's a long story, Sasuke said, gesturing vaguely, and not the most cheerful one, either, even if the shinobi alliance, did win out in the end, and even if I did get to fight alongside you one last time, thanks to the Edo Tensei, Itachi blanched, you mean you used that loathsome, no, the enemy did, Sasuke interjected, but you got hit by a Kotomatsukami you'd crammed down Niruto's throat at an earlier time, intended for me, if I remember correctly, and it broke you out of their control. We actually fought together to stop the guy using Edo Tensei and make him release the Jutsu, a pause, thoughtful silence on Sasuke's part, comma, not that it was all that useful in hindsight, most of the reanimations had already been beaten and sealed, and the worst of the lot actually knew Edo Tensei himself so the reanimated Madara just used the Jutsu on himself before he could actually be dispelled, and things kind of went to hell from there, Itachi stared at his little brother, his expression was blank, uncomprehending, blink, that's not even close to the craziest shit that went down, either, maybe we should start over from the top, Itachi said faintly, yeah, that's probably a good idea, Sasuke agreed, yo Gramps, the Lord Third Hockage looked up from his book, glancing over his shoulder, he saw Naruto sitting on the windowsill behind him, he smiled bemusedly. Hello, Naruto, what brings you here? The blonde shrugged, something I should have gotten out of the way months ago. Honestly, I'd intended to tell you as soon as we'd managed to regain our bearings, but Sasuke had a fit and insisted that it wait until he had a chance to talk with his brother. Hiruzen quirked an eyebrow. His brother he said dryly. Yeah, Itachi, Naruto said. It's kind of a long story, although I suppose you already know part of it, being Hokage and all, Hiruzen hummed. Eyeing the boy thoughtfully, shrewdly, he lit his pipe and gestured for him to make himself comfortable. I hope you don't mind my Anbu listening in he said. Whatever it is you have to say, Naruto dismissed this with an airy wave. Not at all, I understand. Security first and all that, I don't mind. Either way nobody keeps secrets better than Anbu, saying this. The blonde took a seat opposite the sand dame. I see, said the elderly shinobi. That's good, he exhaled a lungful of smoke burning tobacco fumes meandering from his mouth in thin, white curls and wisps. For a moment, neither of them spoke. Then Saratobi smiled and took another drag of his pipe. So, what can I do for you? God aimed Dono, Naruto blinked. You're too off, he said automatically. A beat, comma, but I'm surprised, old man. I have to admit, the blonde remarked, chuckling and shaking his head. Springing that on me so suddenly, haha. I did not expect you to have reached that conclusion, already. How do you figure it out? Saratobi smiled a little wider, it was an educated guess, he said humbly, I'd already ruled out the possibility of you and your friends being infiltrators, for a handful of compelling reasons, between the apparently drastic changes in personality and sudden leaps in skill, plus a number of subtle cues, I could deduce that, firstly, you, Sakura Hiruno, Sasuke Archer, and Hinata Hayuga all suddenly began to exhibit vastly improved abilities surpassing, even many seasoned Jounin within a few days of each other, very shortly after passing the academy exam. Secondly, your personalities had in many ways become wildly different, but also seemed to retain certain core aspects reflecting a similar fundamental psychology. Hinata Hayuga, for instance, while becoming demonstrably more confident and outspoken, 
still had many of the same ingrained mannerisms, showed a very similar worldview and perspective to what her academy reports suggested. Sasuke Uchiha, although seeming to open up and grow vastly more sociable within a small circle of close friends, still maintained a certain trace of darkness, one might say, showing signs of the same underlying childhood trauma, although more healthily coped with and managed. Similarly for Sakura Hiruno and yourself you were very different, and yet, there was a certain sameness at the heart of your personas, inherent qualities of Naruto and Sakura, despite seeming greatly changed on the surface. Thirdly, despite the sudden leaps in ability and changes of personality, there were at no times any indication of noticeably untoward activity. You carried out your roles as New Leaf Ninja admirably, working together with your fellow shinobi, while not seeming to go out of your way to try and fit in, or blend into the background, as a spy or infiltrator might, and even if some of you clearly took umbrage at being forced to carry out menial, low-rank missions, it was not in the same spirit as a squad of restless genin eager for action. No, it was more like, a Chuanin or Jounin, who has been demoted, made to perform missions for which they are vastly overqualified, Serotobi chuckled to himself, as though recalling a mildly amusing joke, and fourthly, Sasuke, Hinata, and yourself all retained certain traits effectively unique to yourselves, things no spy would have the skill to recreate, by Akugan, Shiringan, Kairubi, two rare Daojutsu never found outside the families of Hyruga and Uchiha, and a chakra that only one person can carry at a time, Naruto Sweet dropped at this, thinking of his dad, Sora, and the Gold and Silver Brothers, not quite he thought, comma, but close enough, right, Hiruzen said, Naruto nearly jumped out of his seat, the third laughed, ah you are as much an open book as ever, Naruto, even if regrettably few people yet care to read it, he said, shaking his head and smiling, those who are unfamiliar with you, or who are naturally poor at reading people, might not notice it, but I could see it all on your face, as plain as day, when was the last time you mouthed off to someone and shouted, I'll become Hokage, believe it, blink, Naruto's expression slacked, going a touch pensive, oh hell, he mumbled, letting out a bemused laugh, I hadn't thought about that, it hasn't been something I've needed to prove, or promise, or swear on for years, again, Hiruzen chuckled, yes, if someone tried to impersonate you, Naruto Uzumaki, even having done only the barest and most cursory of research on your personality, your past, is that not something they would have immediately picked up on, to most people, more than your poor grades in the academy, your reputation for pranks and troublemaking, or even your status as the vessel of the nine, tales, that aspiration to become Hokage is the singular defining trait of who you are as a person, and yet, not since graduating the academy have you even once made more than a passing reference to this dream, and I know that the son of your parents would not easily be dissuaded or disillusioned, you take too much after both of them to ever give up on that dream, not without a fight, and I am sure you would go kicking and screaming the entire way, loudly enough that the entire village would have heard it, nostrils flared, and another exhalation of smoke wreathed the Sandame's face, indeed, there seemed to me only one reason that you might so suddenly stop speaking of that dream without my immediately knowing the cause, and that would be if you already were Hockage, presumably you and the other three have come from the future, I am not ignorant to the existence of perpeted time travel jutsu, after all, though I am a little surprised to learn you were not the fifth, too off, did you say, hey Rai Grin, well, unless your grasp of mathematics in the future is even poorer than it was in the past, that leaves two possibilities, and I am fairly certain you are not the Lord Third A smile, so, seventh hockage, then, Naruto scratched the back of his neck, looking sheepish, well last time around you died during the Chunin exams, he mumbled, I remember that pretty clearly, because I'd been riding high on beating Gara when I learned what had happened, and well it felt twice as depressing because of that I think, due to just how far and how fast my spirits plummeted when I heard the news, during the Chuanin exams you say, Hiruzen said, looking mildly perturbed, my, I know I'm getting on in years, but I'd thought I was in reasonably good health for a man my age, especially considering my profession, tell me Naruto, was it a stroke, or perhaps a heart attack, Naruto coughed into his fist, um, actually, you kinda used the Shiki Fuun on Orochimaru, when he invaded Konoha with the Sound and Sand villages, although, that probably won't be problem, this time around, he added, seeing the third's jaw go slack, since I can still feel the Kazakage alive and kicking over in sooner, and that old snake hasn't set foot on the continent in practically a month, I think that beating he got from Hinata convinced him it was time to retire, though I suppose it's lucky for him that he at least didn't target Sasuke, this time, Sakura wouldn't have left enough of him behind to fill a matchbox, if he had, Hiruzen stared at Naruto for a long moment, he leaned back in his seat, expression slack, and numbly extinguished his pipe, after a minute spent absorbing this information, he took a slow, deep breath, 
comma, so it wasn't a very peaceful era you children inherited, was it? He quietly mused, if I died killing my own student, and there were two other hockage between myself and you, Naruto looked away from the sandame. Oh, uh, well, you didn't actually finish Orochimaru, he said sheepishly. Enma Jiaichin's the only one alive who really knows the details, and he won't even tell Konohamaru the specifics, but I figure you couldn't go through with it either because he had been your student, once, and you just didn't have the heart, or else because old age had caught up with you and you just didn't have the strength to rip his soul all the way out of his body, you did get his arms at least, Hiruzen hummed thoughtfully, a rueful expression on his face, a pity he sighed, I should have dealt with him back then, before he could do something like what you said, invading the leaf with two villagers at his back, and one of our allies, at that, ah what a crooked set of affairs this all is, eh, in fairness, Suna was sorta of tricked, Naruto said, Orochimaru impersonated the Kazakage, after killing him, and he's the one who gave the actual order to invade, and after the Sand Ninja learned what had happened, they went right back to being our closest allies, it probably didn't hurt, that I wound up saving the fifth Kazakage from Akatsuki a few years later, either, along with Sakura-chan and Kakashi-sensei, and I suppose even before that, actually, Gara kinda felt indebted to me for helping him get over himself, wait, are you saying Gara became the fifth Kazakage? The third Hokage said, the same Gara who's taking part in these exams, you mean, well, he is the fourth son, Naruto replied, and Shukaku's Jinchuriki, or at least, he was until Shukaku got extracted from him by Akatsuki, he's the Shukaku's, said Hiruzen, then he shook his head, no, or rather, I thought you said you saved him from Akatsuki, having a Biju extracted from you, I'd always understood that to be a fatal process, oh, it is, Naruto said, but Granny Chaya was able to bring him back to life in exchange for her own, sort of like the Rin Tensei, actually, although it seems a lot more limited, Hiruzen took another deep breath, so a child became the fifth Kazakage, then had a Biju torn from him by an organization of S-class criminals, only for you to somehow save him from said group comprised solely of individuals strong enough to stand a realistic chance at taking down Biju, and then the bitter, reclusive, and disillusioned old puppet mistress of Suna gave her life to resuscitate him, well, she wound up needing some chakra from me to actually pull the jutsu off, Naruto shrugged, comma, and we were only up against two of the weaker members, and even then Didera basically just led me and Kakashi Sensei on a wild goose chase while Sakura Chan and Chayo fought Sasori, although Kakashi Sensei did wind up at least ripping off one of Didera's arms with his main Jekaiao Sharingan, Hiruzen blinked, Kakashi has main Jekaiao he said, yeah Naruto said, I don't think he actually knows what that is yet though, or at least that he has it, but him and Abito got it on the same day, as I understand it, you don't mean Abito Uchiha, Hiruzen stared at Naruto, baffled, that boy died in the Battle of Kanabi Bridge, he activated it before giving that eye to Kakashi, then, Naruto cleared his throat sheepishly, oh, jeez, I'd forgotten he was supposed to have died back then, the blonde muttered, ah yeah, pro tip, Abito's still alive, relatedly, Madara Uchiha also survived his last battle with the first Tokage, and clung to life long enough to save Abito from dying back then and take him under his wing, and the two of them basically wound up fucking over the whole rest of the world for several years, since Abito sorta went off the deep end when he saw Kakashi Sensei kill Rin, yeah, you know Akatsuki, that gang of S-class psychos we were just talking about, he's kind of the one pulling the strings behind that whole organization, Madara's dead now, thankfully, but Abito's bad enough on his own, and he's got a lot of very strong and dangerous people convinced that he's Madara, Left to his own devices, he'll gather up the Biju, mash them together to reform the Jubi, transform that into the Shinju, and then cast infinite Tsukuyomi on the whole world. So, yeah, it's kind of a crucial detail, that Abito survived, Hiruzen's mouth worked open and shut soundlessly for several seconds, his face was ashen grey, and his eyes were as wide and round as dinner plates, you are joking right? Trust me, Gramps, I only wish I was, Naruto sighed, then he shrugged. Well, the Akatsuki problem ought to be nipping itself in the bud fairly shortly, either way, so we won't have to worry too much about them, this time around. He inclined his head, ah hot damn, Conan doesn't fuck around, does she? That might be more explosive tags, than I have felt in my entire adult life, and Tenton used to throw that shit around like confetti, no wonder she was so convinced she could take him out, with an ace like that up her sleeve. Hiruzen blinked, Conan he said, what, who one of the rain orphans Jiraiya taught? Naruto supplied, she, Nagato, and Yuhiko, were actually the founding members of Akatsuki, when it was just an organization, dedicated to protecting the land of rain from outside threats, back before Abito came along, sicked Hanzo on them, got Yuhiko killed, then told Nagato and Conan that he was Madara and they should totally follow him, 
The Sandane took a moment to process all of this, his lips twitching in a thoughtful frown. He eyed Naruto shrewdly. You can sense them, he asked. You mentioned being able to sense Orochimaru in the Kazakij, too, and you say Akatsuki is being taken care of. Yeah, Naruto nodded. He paused and tilted his head. Ah, good on you, Sasuke. Thinking to include instructions for Aizanami in the letter, I guess Abito must have had a spare Sharingan in reserve to burn on an Aizanagi, after all. Aizanami, said Hiruzen. Aizanagi? You don't mean, the Uchida clan's most strictly forbidden Kinjutsu do you? Yeah, Sasuke figured Abito might be desperate enough to Aizanagi himself, if Conan and Nagato went at him at the same time. But damn, I did not expect Conan to have that kind of firepower in reserve. I guess she wasn't just kept around for that pretty face, huh? I can't actually sense whatever it is you're sensing, Naruto Hiruzen said. He noticed a strange orange pigmentation forming around the Nanadame's eyes. The blonde gave a start at this, then scratched the back of his neck sheepishly. Oh right, sorry, yeah, so apparently she had like a hundred billion paper bombs, or something like that just chilling around in case Madara-sama ever became a liability, an appreciative hum. Definitely not just for cheesecake, sheesh. I mean, ten straight minutes of explosions that massive. Diderot probably cream his pants if he saw this, she really did not trust Abito, I though he was their leader though, you didn't make it sound like they ever learned of his treachery last time around, Naruto shrugged, Conan might have he said, she sort of vanished off the face of the earth sometime before the fourth shinobi world war, not long before Abito came onto the scene with a brand new Rinnegan, he probably killed her to get at Nagato's, mm I see, Hiruzen said, well that certainly sounds he then paused, his jaw fell open, he did the mother of all double takes, wait, what, you, you just said, Rinnegan, right, as in, the mythical eyes of the sage of six paths, that Rinnegan, the one and only Naruto replied, though it's not really that special, I mean, Madara had a pair, Nagato had Madara's, Abito used one of Nagato's, and hell, even Sasuke got one, after Rikudo Jiaichin gave him his yin chakra heroes and stared, Sa, Sasuke, Sasuke Uchiha, he gaped, he has the Rinnegan, he met, the sage of six paths, so did I, Naruto said, and Sakura-chan, Kakashi-sensei plus you, the first and second Hokage, and my dad, when the four of us were fighting old lady Kaguya in another dimension, hell, even all the other past cage kinda met him, when he summoned their souls from the afterlife to perform a joint summoning jutsu along with you three to get us back out of that dimension after me and Sasuke used the yin and yang chakras we got from Rikudo, Jiaichin to seal Kaguya and Black Zetsu away for good, where nobody could break them out, Okay, Hiruzen said slowly, either Homura and Koharu conspired to replace my tobacco with something else, or you just said a lot of things that shouldn't make sense in any sort of sane or rational world, Naruto shrugged, well you four were kinda brought back to life by Orochimaru using Edo Tensei to answer some questions for Sasuke about the Uchiha massacre and what the hell a village is, and Kaguya was Rikudo Jiaichin and his brother's mum, who apparently got real pissed that they were born with chakra when she'd had to break the ultimate taboo and eat the Shinju's fruit to gain it and merged with the Shinju to become the Jubi, then got beaten by her sons, then her body got sealed in the moon when Rikudo Jiaichin was dying, and her chakra was split into the nine Biju, and she gave birth to a third son while this was happening, somehow, and he skulked around for a few thousand years basically pulling strings and vandalizing sacred texts to manipulate people into eventually trying to reunite the Biju and perform infinite Tsukuayomi on the world, which would free his mum and send everything straight to shit, Hiruzen gawped at Naruto, looking more like a buffoon, than a ninja so brilliant and masterful as to have been called Shinobi no Kami, then Naruto blinked, oh ow, that is not a pleasant way to go weakly, Hiruzen shook his head, what, you don't wanna know, Naruto said, shuddering, I guess seeing Abito trapped and defenseless in Ai's enemy was just too much of an opportunity for Conan to pass up, that woman is as terrifying as she is gorgeous, and let me tell you, if I weren't happily married, and also physically only 13, I would tap that so hard, Hiruzen nodded weakly, I see he murmured, so, that takes care of Akatsuki, does it, almost, Naruto said, Sasuke's talking to Itachi, and it feels like Kisame's about to get a visit from an old friend, on the Mizukage's behalf methinks, and as for the rest, well, what about the rest of them, Sasuke, Itachi asked within the confines of Tsukuyomi, frowning at the one-armed man who it seemed truly was his baby brother, even if you think Pain and Conan can handle Marder, Abito, and won't just go right back to their prior activities once he's dead, that still leaves several S-class rogue ninja running around with no one to keep them in check, Sasuke laughed, hey, that hockage of mine may not be the sharpest crayon in the box, and Shikamaru may not have come back with us, but he's still got a pretty terrifying mind in his own right, that Naruto, 
while it's not like we didn't help him iron out the details, he's still probably the only one with the audacity to actually go ahead use a gambit this outrageous, pardon, Itachi murmured, dear Tsuchikage, yo, I hear you've been working with these jerks called Akatsuki, not cool man, I hear they're serious bad news, like, wanting to gather all the biju kind of bad news, believe me, you don't wanna get mixed up with that sort, what would people think if they found out you were providing employment to wanted criminals and S-class missing ninja, nothing good, that's for sure, personally, I'd advise cutting ties with them now and erasing any proof of your cooperation with those guys, before they go and piss off the wrong people, think about it man, sincerely, the son of the yellow flash fence sitter Anoki gripped the letter in his hands until it was thoroughly creased and crumpled, flying through an abandoned ghost town, he glared at the attached photo of a grinning, spiky haired blonde boy with blue eyes, holding a Rasengan in one hand and a Horatian Kune in the other, gr damn it, he muttered to himself, when I find out who's responsible for this, tch, to think that bastard could have reproduced, when he first got the letter, naturally he'd had the photo checked for any signs of forgery or editing, the finest experts in Iowa had taken one look at the picture, declared it 100% genuine, then taken a second look at the picture, and shit their pants in horror, it was mortifying, but if someone with access to the fourth Hokage's son knew of his past business with Akatsuki, for a moment, Obito Acheha was convinced he had died, it was a very long and very painful moment in which the entirety of his existence seemed to be on fire, a blinding agony which consumed him down to the very slightest fibers of his being. It seemed sure to him, self-evident and inescapable, that he was dead and in hell. He could be forgiven for assuming this, because Conan did not pull her punches, and Nagato's eyes anime had left him completely defenseless. It probably would have had been less brutal if they'd simply had him drawn and quartered or flayed alive. Very nearly he had died, with his life functions dipping well below the standard baseline for several minutes, so far below that there was at least a quarter hour stretch of time during which his heart didn't actually beat, like at all. He came close enough to dying that his chakra dwindled too low for even Naruto to sense, and this was a man who could detect and discern the life energy of microbes, so that was saying a whole lot of something, however, despite all this, Obito wasn't quite dead, technically, no, like a paragon among cockroaches, he clung to the faintest vestige of life even an hour after being left for dead in the smallest, wettest, smelliest ditch Nagato and Conan could find. Achita were tenacious sons of bitches to begin with, and as more than a third of the soft tissues in his body had been replaced with concentrated cell cultures from the Lord First Hockage, Abito was nearly impossible to put down. Slow to bleed, slow to die, and with a healing factor to boot. It took him a while to realize this himself though. After what felt like a long and tumultuous epoch of horrible, soul-rending torment, lying there motionless and numb though unfortunately not numb enough to escape the ungodly pain, he noticed that he could move one of his fingers when a weak, shuddering convulsion caused him to flinch and brush the digit against a piece of broken glass, and then he spent several seconds in a disbelieving shock that somehow, despite even his own expectations, he had managed to survive that horrible, unspeakably brutal beatdown. He was alive, fucking alive, he might have jumped to his feet in celebration if he still had the strength to do so, or feet, the right one, at least, seemed to be slowly reforming, but the one on the left was a lost cause, in fact, that seemed to be the case for most of that side of his body, although his heart and head were still fortunately intact, more or less, irony, or so he presumed, last time he came this close to death, the entire right side of his body had been all but crushed into a fine paste, he'd only survived, then, because Madara had been there to graft to Shirama Putty onto that mashed and broken half of his carcass, and now because of that, this time it was the left side of his body that wouldn't be coming out of this disaster resembling anything close to functional, with his left arm and leg, and a good chunk of his abdomen, basically just gone, probably they were a red smear on some wall somewhere in the rain village, a bloody mess, that was no doubt being washed away in meandering rusty rivulets by the ceaseless, omnipresent precipitation even as he thought about it, gruesome, morbid, and horrendously excruciating, that was pretty much the story of his life these days, wasn't it, once again, he had come out of an otherwise certain death situation thanks to the modifications made to his body, he felt significantly less grateful for that than was probably healthy, part of him wanted to just lie there and wait to die, but as he felt tendrils of questionably animal tissue threading through his perforated corpse to wrap thin cellulose cords around damaged organs, Seeping as slowly as molasses through a sponge to fill the gaps and gaping holes in his mutilated anatomy, he knew that this was dreadfully unlikely to work, not unless he waited two to three weeks, and even that was only assuming these bloody bastard plant cells were incapable of leaching nutrients from the soil. Ugh, he muttered. Ugh, well, this was a nuisance, not only had Nagato and Conan betrayed him, but they hadn't even had the decency to finish the job and make absolutely sure he was dead. 
so not only was he not released from his obligations and half-baked schemes, but now he would have to figure out some way to salvage his, or rather Madara's plans. It was about now that Abito mused on the downside of making Nagato the face of Akatsuki's leadership, while it did allow him to deflect attention from himself while he waited and worked behind the scenes, it also meant that Tendao Pain, Nagato's Deva Path, was the person Akatsuki's members followed, and while that had been perfectly fine and dandy back when Nagato was just a player dancing to the tune of his pipe, now that the Uzumaki descendant and his loyal partner had rebelled, it meant that Abito no longer had any real control over the organization. That was kind of problematic, Christ. Ugh, Abito miserably groaned. How the hell was he going to get out of this mess? If he was going to continue Madara's plan, he would have to find some way to turn this situation in his favor. If Conan and Nagato chose to continue in the plans to gather the Biju, then maybe he could just bide his time in the shadows and build his strength back up until they had all the tailed beasts, only to swoop in at the last second and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, if they carried on in his plans to collect the Biju. But something told Abito that this was unlikely. Before he came along, Akatsuki had simply been an organization of freedom fighters, basically just a ramshackle militia, aside from the fact that one of its leaders possessed Madara's Rinnegan. Their only goal had been to improve the quality of life in Ama, more like a neighborhood watch committee than an extremist terrorist cell, at least by ninja standards, and now that they had figured out his role in the death of their friend, and in turning Hanzo against their little band of merry men, it seemed unlikely that Nagato and Conan would carry out the plans he'd given them, they might try to return Akatsuki to its roots, even, hell, they might actually try to make nice with Hanzo, this was troublesome, maybe he could try and lure some Akatsuki members away from the fold, so to speak, even nearly a century after the founding of the hidden villages, the name of Madara Archer has still carried a lot of weight, people feared and respected that name, that man had become nearly mythologized in the shinobi world, Nagato and Conan probably never would have thrown their lots in with some disenfranchised jerk-off named Abito, but tell them he was the Madara Achiha, and even the man with the makings of a full-on god complex would defer. That was how just how big Madara's legend was, he was larger than life, at least one or two of the Akatsuki members would probably come under his wing, that way. Kisame definitely, and Zetsu as well, that new recruit, who'd just been teamed up with Kikuzu could probably also be easy to manipulate especially if he offered the guy a chance for lots of murder and bloodshed in the name of his heathen god. Kakuzu himself would be harder. Abito Uchiha didn't really have any capital to his name, now that Akatsuki had been taken out from under him. Payne and Conan were the ones with the resources, and they could easily keep the old cynic on board as long as they paid him and provided him sufficient opportunities to earn money. Itachi was not an option, for several reasons, not least of which because he'd seen the boy at that reunion, and knew the true reason behind Itachi's massacre of the clan. When you got down to it, Itachi was loyal to Konoha. Abito could try to pressure him by threatening to destroy the village and kill Sasuke if he didn't cooperate, but in his current state that would be suicidal. Sasori was tricky. The guy didn't really have any strong motivations one way or the other. He worked for Akatsuki because it was something to do, and gave him at least somewhat of an umbrella against assassins and bounty hunters. There wasn't much Abito could use to manipulate a guy as detached as that, and while he could probably try getting him with a reverse therapy jutsu, that could just as easily backfire. Diderot would be another challenge, on one hand, he hated Akatsuki with a fiery passion, which Abito could certainly use to lure him away from the organization. On the other hand, the guy also quite vocally hated Achiha, and there was no telling what sort of reaction the name Madara might get from him. He might be cowed into serving him, or he might go ballistic and blow the both of them sky high. Abito sighed, well, he was getting ahead of himself either way, after all, he was only barely alive at the moment, and badly dismembered besides. He maybe had enough chakra to slip into his pocket dimension, but most likely he'd pass out the moment he got there, if he tried using that space-time jutsu now, although that would be safer than lying in some ditch in a mega cure. That rain coming down was linked to one of Payne's sensory jutsu, and if he waited to accumulate enough chakra to use his transportation technique flawlessly, he would almost certainly become a noticeable blip on the man's radar, and that would be cutting things a little too close for his tastes, he'd be out of it for a while longer, probably, but at least in that pocket dimension, he had the supplies to tend himself once he woke up. It wasn't like the members of Akatsuki would be going anywhere anytime soon. With a groan, Abito rolled onto his good side and looked into the water for a moment as he channeled his chakra. Then he blinked. Blankly, Abito stared at his reflection. He looked like ruminated shit, but that was not what caught his attention. No. He looked at his eye. His fucking eye. Not red. Not black. Not a crimson iris embedded with a central pupil, supported by three tomoe, not a slender, tree-bladed propeller churning a sea of blood, pure grey, with concentric circles, 
Circles inside of circles inside of goddamn metherfucking circles, he had a rin again, somehow, after all this shit, he had awakened that eye, the irony was not lost on him, throwing his head back, Ibito Uchiha broke out into hysterical, miserable laughter, Kakuzu stared bemusedly, for a moment, at the big pile of nothingness that had not a second earlier been his newest partner, a part of him wanted to laugh, seeing the one guy, who'd actually seemed able to survive his rampages thanks to being literally immortal utterly destroyed with just a flick of the wrist, of course, it was the idiot's own fault for charging someone like this headlong, one of the only limitations of his immortality was that hidden did not heal appreciably faster or better than a normal person, he couldn't regenerate a lost limb, it needed to be sewn back on, reattached, he was pretty tough, and Kakuzu's threads were ideal for tending to any especially troublesome wounds the idiot might receive, but there were limits to what could be repaired, honestly, given how common explosive notes and paper bombs were, Kakuzu found it amazing that Hidden hadn't gotten himself blown to bits ages ago, that immortality might be useful against people who relied on precision killing blows, or even against most of Kakuzu's worst elemental jutsu, but there were monsters out there to whom Hidden's cursed jutsu and immortal body would be little more than a mild inconvenience, some of those monsters even worked for Akatsuki, Hidden was like a child who had grown arrogant from having a halfway useful parlor trick up his sleeve, to Kakuzu, the young man's attitude was laughable, he had a nifty ability, but no worthwhile idea of how to employ it, just because he couldn't bleed out or die from ordinarily mortal wounds, the Dumbus thought he was invincible, kids today didn't know what true power looked like, they got cocky over mastering simple jutsu and clever bits of weapon handling, these recent generations were soft and coddled, people like Hidden could never understand, Kakuzu understood power, he knew what real strength looked like, had witnessed true mastery of the shinobi arts, his parents had lived through the Warring States era, in those days of endless conflict and indiscriminate bloodshed, Kakuzu himself had served in a handful of battles, carried out a couple missions, before the hidden village system gained popularity, his parents, his family, barely large enough to be called a true clan, although they had a respectable history joined the hidden waterfall village shortly after it was formed, they were weary of the old ways, and sincerely believed that, as part of a larger collective, they could find something like security and prosperity, Kakuzu inherited that idealism, and those hopes kindled a zealous fervor in his heart, he served the village, believing in the dreams of his parents, doing whatever was asked of him as a shinobi, in this way he rose through the ranks, earning himself a reputation for completing every mission he was given without fail, and so he was eventually entrusted with a task of the greatest danger and difficulty, a task that everyone believed to surely be impossible, perhaps in hindsight, they had meant it as a suicide mission, Maybe he'd risen too far in prestige and begun to worry the leadership with his sterling reputation and growing status, or maybe they had simply been stupid and desperate enough to think it could actually be done. Whatever the case, he was given that fateful mission to assassinate the Lord First Hokage, Hishirama Senju. Kakuzu hadn't stood a chance, he'd thought himself a skilled ninja, before then, believed that he was talented, and that with enough determination any obstacle could be overcome, and Hishirama had seemed trusting, oblivious to the idea that anyone might want him dead. It was so easy to get in close, the man didn't seem to suspect anything untoward even as Kakuzu drew his dagger, but that was as far as he got. The woman beside the hockage, his wife Mito, pierced Kakuzu with a cold glance the instant he resolved to strike, he froze up beneath her gaze. He is here to kill you dear, she said that to Hashirama, betrayed the purpose of Kakuzu's visit with such nonchalance that almost he had felt tempted to laugh because of course the crazy bitch wouldn't sound worried even when a foreign shinobi was inches away from plunging a knife through her beloved's throat, but then Hashirama laid a hand on Kakuzu's wrist, and looked him in the eye, he knew true fear in that instant, this was no mere ninja, this was not a lowly mortal man like himself, this was something else, something great and terrible and utterly beyond his ken, ancient tree and grandeur, something as old as the green forests, as deep as the oceans and immovable as the mountains, unassailable, indomitable, invincible, Truly and absolutely, Hashirama never even needed to lay a hand on Kakuzu, did not have to say a word or make a single threatening gesture. That single glance vanquished the assassin, unmanned him and laid him low, robbing him of all resolution, all determination. Kakuzu fell to his knees in awe and horror, all thoughts of completing his mission of killing his target, fled his mind, he could see it. Hashirama sat behind his desk, and behind him was a great, spectral bodhisattva, an austere god with a thousand hands and a carven, dispassionate visage, the weight of that glance, the quiet consideration of something so immense and lofty, was enough to crush Kakuzu and press his face to the ground, he vomited in terror, trembling and weeping uncontrollably, wordlessly begging for mercy, Hashirama dismissed him with a single, unconcerned gesture, graced him with a slight pitying smile, 
That smile was more than Kikuzu's own village showed him, disgraced by his failure, and fearful of retaliation, Takigakyo's leadership resolved to have Kikuzu executed in a gesture of reconciliation. After everything he had done for the village, the unflinching loyalty he had shown them, they betrayed him over that single failure, planned to execute for coming short of doing the impossible. This betrayal showed Kikuzu the truth of the world, and that encounter with Hashirama showed him what true power looked like. Kikuzu was well informed, he knew that there was only one man who had ever been considered even close to equaling Hashirama Senju, hell, any school child could have told you that much. He also knew that the man who appeared before himself and hidden was one of the only people to survive a battle with that man. Fence sitter Anoki, master of the unparalleled particle style, he and his mentor, the Null Man Mew, escaped to fight against Madara Acheha with their lives intact. The sand-aimed Suchikich was probably one of the only men alive, with whom Kikuzu felt the need to tread lightly, him, Pain, and Hiruz and Serotobi. Those were the only three shinobi on this planet to whom Kikuzu could imagine himself possibly even marginally inferior. And of those three, Anoki was the only one whose strength he could conceivably compare to the first Hokage. Shinobi no Kami was not a title given lightly, and the Rinnegan was a power straight from the annals of myth and legend, but Anoki survived a battle against Madara Uchiha as a lowly genin. He and his master fought the only man to have ever stood within spitting distance of Hashirama Senju's power, and they lived to tell the tale. That was enough to convince Kikuzu to respect this man's power, even apart from the awesome reputation of the Jintan he wielded, and hidden charged him straight on with no plan. Suicide, plain and simple, immortality didn't mean much when a single attack could obliterate you on a subatomic level and erase every corporeal trace of your existence with the ease of swatting a fly. HMP aged. So much for sewing that idiot back together, Kikuzu muttered, looking up at the third Sachikij. This statement betrayed nothing of his trepidation or worry. Anoki snorted. Don't worry, he said, forming a second cone of light between his hands. You'll join him soon enough. Kasem Hishigaki tilted his head bemusedly when Samehida began to squirm in her bindings. She whispered to him in a voice he knew well, tied to his chakra and his blood, told him of a familiar scent, the signature of a man they called Demon. Kasem was sitting outside the quarters of the minor noble who had hired himself and Itachi's bodyguards, covering for his partner as the Ucha had dealt with some unfinished family business. He had water clones covering every point of ingress, disguised under Henge to avoid drawing suspicion. Security here was airtight, thanks chiefly to himself, but someone managed to get through all the same. Kasem smiled. Hello, Zabuza san. Fancy meeting you here, the demon of the hidden mist held the executioner blade to his former comrade's neck. Kasem did not so much as flinch. My would like a word with you, Kasem. Zabuza's voice was low as ever, gravelly and deep. His tone was grim, serious. Kiri is cleaning up the mess it's made these past couple of decades, and you're one of the biggest spills, Kasem smiled. It was all teeth, is that so, he replied. I must say, this is quite a surprise, Zabuza san. I had been under the impression that you were determined to install yourself as Mizukij, but now you are taking orders from my Chan. My, my, how the mighty have fallen. I had a change of heart, Zabuza said. Not that I expect you to understand, but I was reminded of what a real cage should be. That kid, Uzumaki, he shook his head. Hair, a thug like myself could never make the cut. I'm just here to do Lady Mizukage's dirty work. He pressed the edge of his sword a hair tighter against Kasem's neck. Not enough to draw blood. But it was distinctly uncomfortable. A lesser man would have started sweating bullets. Kasem was cool as a cucumber. So the rabid demon has become a lowly attack dog, he said. How sad. But I must wonder, if you don't think you have the power to become Mizukage, then how do you possibly delude yourself into believing that you can match this keiju? That kind of thinking is a trap, Zabuza said, smirking, one that a ninja of your caliber should know to avoid. Yes, I said I'm not cut out to be Mizukage, but I wasn't talking about power. Frankly, I'd say we're about equal. Aside from that monster you've got strapped to your back, you greatly overestimate yourself, I think, Kasem chuckled, grasping the edge of Zabuza's sword, or else dreadfully underestimate me. If you dare to call us equals, he pushed the sword away from his neck, unbothered by the edge of it digging into his palm. Blood seeped out over the blade, and Kasem smiled as he grabbed Samehida's hilt with his other hand. Zabuza's hands tensed, and his arms flexed with effort. I wasn't apprenticed to Fuguki-sensei for my dashing good looks, after all, Kasem started to draw his weapon. Then he stopped. Suddenly, his grip went slack, and his arms slumped bonelessly at his side. Needles protruded from his flank, his shoulders, his wrists. A beat. And I wasn't called the master of silent killing for charging my enemies head-on, Zabuza replied affording himself a small grin. That Samehida is a frightful weapon, I'll admit, not least of which because of your mastery, but I reckon I've got a pretty keen sword of my own in reserve. A smile. Kasem, 
Meet my apprentice, a slight, slender figure garbed in the manner of Kiri's hunter core stepped out of the shadows, silken black hair was contained in a bun, and a porcelain mask concealed the ninja's face, Haku, Zabuza added, nodding to the hunter nin, meet your prey, Kisame laughed, so you've got a partner of your own do you, he mused, pretty young though, I dare say mine could beat yours, he inclined his head, in fighting or cross-dressing, he's a very pretty man, that Itachi, I do not doubt he could best me, in combat, Haku responded, I have witnessed the fearsome prowess of the Uchiha clan first hand, and I know that I have a very long way to go before I can measure up to such an opponent, in combat, a moment of silence, something like a smile might have come onto the youth's face, comma, but my sama says I can pull off a sailor uniform better than any girl, Kisame arched an eyebrow, you he said, and my chan, now there is something I would have not expected, she likes younger men, Haku said with a shrug, and as for myself, well ah, uh, I can't imagine there's a straight man alive who could say no to her, Zabuza coughed into his fist, you'd be surprised he muttered, sacrificial lamb, Kise mouthed, looking from Haku to Zabuza, she was getting obsessed with finding a nice guy, Zabuza mouthed back, scarily so, Kisame shook his head pityingly, she was always quite fond of younger men he said, but how old are you then, if she's picked you for her boy toy, 16, said Haku, my birthday was a few weeks ago I see, Kisame squinted at Haku, and when is she planning the wedding for, next June, Haku said, sounding quite happy, Kisame shook his head again, she has him bad, doesn't she, Zabuza shrugged hopelessly, I think it's an honor to be chosen as Lady Mizukage's intended, Haku interjected demurely, I hope to do her station proud and become a bride worthy of my sama, a beat, ah, I think you mean bridegroom, Kisame replied, I know what I said red heart, Haku chirped, she was quite insistent on that part, said I would look better in the bridal clothes than she would red heart, Kisame's sweet dropped, I see, he turned his head to look at Zabuza, and this is the woman you're planning to bring me back to, unless you prove uncooperative Zabuza said, waving a hand airily, then I'm authorized to kill you, and since Haku has already hit your pressure points, well, what do you think the prudent choice would be, a beat, Kisame was silent for a minute, well, Zabuza said, what do you say, Kisame coughed, I'm weighing my options, he answered, she's not that bad, Zabuza said, rolling his eyes, especially not now that she's got a boyfriend in Haku, and doesn't feel so self-conscious about being unmarried, honestly, I was on the fence about her myself, until I really bothered to look, he shrugged, but when I did, I realized that she had the same eyes as that kid, something you can't fake or copy, real quality, a singular purity of purpose and surety of resolve, the eyes of a true cage, Kisame stared at Zabuza, what kid, he wondered, catching a second reference to something odd, Haku smiled, somehow, even with it hidden underneath the boy's mask, Kisame was immediately aware of this fact, almost the air seemed to light up with warm recollection, a nearly tangible fondness, your partner's brother he whispered, Sasuke Uchiha, and his teammate Sakura Hiruno, they were unlike anything I have ever seen, monstrously powerful, eclipsing even the legendary copy ninja, but even they, deferred to that runt, Zabuza said, that kid who could rehabilitate even the lowest and most remorseless scum on the face of this earth with a single punch and a two minute lecture, he chuckled, I don't know, maybe he's actually even more powerful than them, but all I saw was a dazzling radiance, some quality that shined through even in a snot-nosed punk like him, I'd never seen anything like it, and I thought looking at him, I couldn't help but think, that this was what a cage should be, that next to this kid, my own inadequacy was perfectly apparent, I wasn't ready, I didn't have what it took, next to someone like him, or like my, simple thugs like you or me just can't measure up, strength is our only virtue, Haku nodded, yes, there was just something about him, about his friends, that Naruto Uzumaki so, Kisame, Old pal, said Zabuza, turning to face the Pisine Shinobi, what say you now, a moment of silence, I'm still weighing my options, TCH, this is pathetic, a wave of glittering black crashed over a gilt fluid rampart, white noise hissing, the tumultuous grating of hundreds of thousands of metallic grains rolling and tumbling together, tendrils arched out, coils and wisps of gold and iron twining and thundering in a cataclysmic violence, like a piece of abstract art, the Yondame Kazakage's gold dust wrestled with the Sandame's iron sand. It was a near stalemate, a fierce duel of hidden sand magnet style. Sasori stared blankly at Rosa. If he could, he would have smirked. HMPH, don't blame yourself. Fourth, your predecessor's jutsu is simply too powerful for you to beat. Swirling, leaping, darting and rushing and rising and falling. Hundreds of shapes clear and indefinable. Thousands of points where these fluid masses met and pushed. It was beautiful and indescribable the contest of these metallic sands, no words could convey how subtly the substances interplayed, 
the millions of ways in which they were shaped and moved against each other, like tie-dye and lava lamps, blood spatter and stress fractures, there was a quintessential expression of chaos in the unpredictable turbulence of these wrestling jutsu, it was conceptual sumo, a battle of wills which defied literal or mathematical expression, like water coming out of a faucet, the swirling clouds of a hurricane, sand sliding down the sides of an excavation, it was marvelous, who said I was talking about my own performance, Rosa growled out, wheeling his arms, keeping the iron sand at bay with his denser but softer gold dust, he didn't appear at all tired or perturbed as he directed his medium like the conductor of an orchestra, he stepped back and thrust two clenched fists forward, his gold dust crashed through the iron sand, a stampeding bulwark that scattered the ferric filings like leaves before a gale, splaying his fingers, he then spread the mass of gold out in a curling tidal wave that threatened to drown Sasori and his marionette, that puppet of yours can't even compare to the real thing, Rosa spat, the sand dame's jutsu was nowhere near this week, Lady Chayo watched this display, her grandson's mother and father puppets on standby, Sasori glared and drew his own hands wide apart, Satetsu Keihau, fractal branches of iron lashed out, crossbeam struts and pillars catching the crashing wave of gold, distorting and disrupting it, Rosa scoffed and turned on his feet, moving his arms in flowing downward arcs, his gold poured in serpentine tendrils, diving through the mesh of forked iron barbs, fingers ducking down the path of least resistance and flooding a world of ferric sand, pathetic, he repeated, simply pitiful, that puppet might have the chakra, the jutsu of the Sandame Kazakage, but it lacks any will aside from your own, the power and flexibility of its techniques are limited by your experience and tactical prowess, he shook his head, feeling his gold sand bury Sasori, and the third Kazakage puppet, maybe that puppet is enough against most foes, but it's merely a shadow of the true cage, just a pale imitation he curled his hands slowly into fists, but feel honored, Akasuna, for few men indeed are floated across the sticks in coffins of pure gold, the sands imploded, high above the battlefield, on a large sculpted bird, a vaguely effeminate man sat cross -legged. he was deep in thought, his flying mount dodged beams of electric blue, a laser barrage aimed to snipe him out of the sky, okay, Diderah, let's think about this logically, so, apparently your art is diffused when it comes into contact with lightning chakra, that's kind of a big weakness when fighting two of the strongest Raten users alive, but I'm sure you can figure something out. The clay bird dropped a few more clay bombs, mostly just to give those bastards on the ground something else to shoot it. The guy with the sword was the main problem, with that long distance rant and ninjutsu of his, but the rakage and the nibi were nothing to sneeze at either. The fourth rakage's lightning armor was troublesome, and seemed capable of tanking smaller explosions that were set off outside its immediate reach even apart from automatically defusing any of Diderah's bombs that happened to touch the man, the blonde couldn't use his most powerful attacks, either, for fear of instantly killing the two tails Jinchuriki, the bosses would not be happy if he fucked that up, Diderah groaned in frustration, damn it he cursed, what the hell am I supposed to do against those bastards, if they can no sell my basic stuff, and any attacks that might be strong enough to kill them without getting close enough for the bastards to defuse would probably kill the nibby, too, don't worry, came a woman's voice, interrupting him, sit still for a moment, and I'll take care of all your problems, Diderah blinked, hey, he turned to see Yujito Nyai crouching on the back of his bird, right behind him, wow, how the hell did you get up here I jumped, said Yujito blithely, 